Oh, do you mind giving me a quick sound check? Yes. Zoning docket 1721 considers a text amendment to allow indoor and outdoor shooting ranges in certain districts throughout the city. Sorry, couldn't hear you, Paul. Everyone, try again. Wait, uh, say that again. I think he said he couldn't hear you. Oh. Uh, Larry, zoning docket 1721 considers a text amendment to allow indoor and outdoor shooting ranges in certain districts throughout the city. Bob, I see you in the meeting. Can you hear me? If, if so, do you mind giving us a quick sound check? I can hear you. It's uh, not. I can good. hear you, Larry. Okay, it appears we're having issues with the, uh, the sound right now. Hi, hey, Stephen. Um, we could hear you earlier when you did your sound check. Can you try one more time for us? Testing, testing. One, two, three. Did you hear that, Larry? Hey guys, can you try one more time? Sorry about all this. Oh, you go this time. Testing, testing, three, two, one. All right, y'all sound great. Sorry for all this. Are you already the host, Larry? I am. I, I am under your name. Stephen, are you on? Yes. Sorry. Did Did you see this, Bob? Did you see uh, Kelly's? Yeah, I'm I'm responding to her right now. Okay. I just I just sent it to her also. Thanks, Rob.
Good afternoon, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Good yes, afternoon. So it looks like we do have a quorum. We do, okay. All right, so at this time now, I'll, on March 23rd at 1.32, I'll call the CPC uh, meeting um, for today to order. Uh, we'll start with a roll call. Um, Commissioner Flick. Present in the dark. <laughs> Commissioner <laughs> Mobley. So what else is new there? Commissioner Mobley. Yeah. Present with lights still for now. Commissioner Stieg. Uh, here and lights. Commissioner Stewart here. Uh, Commissioner Wittry. Wittry is here. I, now, did I miss any commissioners? I was just going based on. One. Yeah, Commissioner Brown. Lund, okay. Commissioner. Brown and Commissioner Lund are present as well. Any other com uh, com any other commissioners? You have sunny skies where you are, Jonathan. Apparently. Um, just about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have seven commissioners present. All right. So I'll start the meeting by reading our special rules uh, into the record. Um, the special public hearing rules uh, for the city planning commission hearing held via uh, conference. Order of business. The order of business at the hearing shall be as followed. Call to order and roll call with recording of members present, approval of minutes, reading of the hearing rules, presentation of docket, staff presentations, applicant presentations, questions from members, a recess for 30 minutes, consideration of docket, public comment, rebuttal by the applicant, questions from members, voting adjournment. Presentation of dockets. The order of business for each docket shall be as followed. Presentation by the city planning commission staff or the department of safety and permit staff. Presentation by the applicant or their representatives. The appellate or the applicant may appear on their behalf or be represented by a duly authorized agent. Only one representative may speak on behalf of a request and must pre-register with the staff of the city planning commission. Other representatives or speakers may sign up to provide comments during the public comment portion of the meeting. The applicant shall be allowed a maximum of three minutes. Question from members. The members have an opportunity to ask questions of the staff or applicant. Recess. The commission and board shall take a 30 minute recess to allow members of the public to comment. Public comment. Only written public comment will be allowed. Live public comment will not be allowed no member of the public may submit more than one written comment per agenda item. Time allowed for public comment. The public comment form will be made available at the start of the meeting and will close at the end of the 30 minute recess. 
Public comments may be submitted electronically on the form provided by City Planning Commission. Any comment missing this information will not be read aloud. Each submission must contain the commenter's first and last name, the commenter's address, and whether the commenter is being paid in connection with his or her comments, the agenda item. Reading of public comments, a moderator will read into the record all comments pertaining to that item that have been submitted in accordance with the rules. Comments will be read aloud in a norm normal speaking voice. The moderator will discontinue reading a comment once it exceeds two minutes. Rebuttal by the applicant. Following the public co comment period, if there is opposition, the authorized representative of the application is allowed a rebuttal not to exceed three minutes. Question from members. Following the comment and rebuttal, the members have an opportunity to ask question of the staff or applicant. Voting. Making a motion. The member making a motion shall clearly state their name when making a motion. For example, I, Commissioner Stewart, move to approve the request. Seconding a motion. The member seconding the motion shall clearly state their name for when seconding a motion. For example, I, Commissioner Stewart, second the motion made by Commissioner Mobley. Statement by the chair. The chair will restate the motion confirming who made and seconded the motion. Voting. The chair will request a verbal vote for each member by roll call. Each member will indicate yay to vote in support of the motion or nay to vote in opposition. At this time, before we start our um, docket, um, we have three items that, well, two items that have been removed uh, from the, today's agenda. Um, if anyone is watching in reference to um, these items, and that is zoning docket 1921 and also zoning docket 2021. So we'll take action on the first item on the, on the, on the agenda, which is the adoption of the minutes of the March 9th, 2021 regular meeting. I, Commissioner Wittry, adopt the minutes from the March 9th, 2021 regular meeting. Is there a second to that motion? Aye. Commissioner Fickle, second. All right. It's been moved by Commissioner Wittry for adoption of the uh, March 9th, 2021 regular meeting uh, minutes, uh, seconded by Commissioner Flick. Is there any further discussion on that motion? There's no further discussion um, on that uh, motion. Um, I'll call the question. Uh, Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner Flick. Yes. Commissioner Lund. Yes. Commissioner Mobley. Yes. Commissioner Steve. Uh, yes. Commissioner Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Wittry. Yes. I right. would any other commissioners join us that I did not call. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Weedberg is here. All right. Commissioner Weedberg. Mr. Weaver. Yes. All right. So unanimous support for uh, the motion and it is carried. Um, we will continue on to zoning docket 1721. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Zoning docket 1721 considers a text amendment to allow indoor and outdoor shooting ranges in certain districts around the city. Neither indoor nor outdoor shooting ranges are currently allowed as permitted or conditional uses in Orleans Parish. Staff conducted research on several municipalities that regulate indoor and outdoor shooting ranges and provide specific design, operational, and performance criteria for these uses. The staff also researched the 2004 revised edition of the National Rifle Association's Range Source Book, a guide to planning and construction, which provides guidance to operators and municipalities on the construction, operation, and maintenance of these facilities. Staff found that the land uses Land use impacts of indoor shooting ranges are mitigated through the design and operation and that these impacts will be comparable to the effects of other destination uses in commercial and industrial districts. Therefore, the staff recommends that indoor shooting ranges should be permitted by right in the C2 auto-oriented commercial district, C3 heavy commercial district, LI light industrial district, and HI heavy industrial district. In contrast to indoor shooting ranges, outdoor shooting ranges can result in levels of noise 
and the potential for damage to people or properties that is so significant, it can only be mitigated to the extent to which that might be possible by the imposition of operational site design and other standards. Outdoor ranges require increased site design elements such as customized backstops, side berms or walls, and safety baffles that are vital to the safety of the users and nearby properties. <clears throat> These site design elements are customized on a case-by-case -case basis and require specialized engineering and review. The staff recommends that outdoor shooting ranges should be designated as conditional uses in the HI heavy industrial district. The conditional use designation is appropriate since it will be provided an opportunity to receive public input while requiring the review of outdoor shooting ranges on a case-by-case -case basis and allow for site-specific safety and operational mitigations to be imposed on particular outdoor ranges. Additionally, the staff recommends specific use standards that are necessary to ensure that proposed shooting ranges operate in a safe manner that is consistent with industry norms and standards and do not negatively affect nearby properties. Staff recommends modified approval of zoning docket 1721. All right, thank you. At this time now, um, the applicant, I don't believe is not president of the city council. So at this time, um, any questions from any commissioner for the staff as it relates to this zoning docket? If we don't have any questions uh, for staff. Um, we uh, Jonathan, I'm sorry, I have a question for Paul. Uh, I was wondering, this came to us through council motion and um, I'm assuming there was some applicant that had an interest in this and uh, I, I don't see a companion docket here with an application. Uh, is that to come later or is this just out of the blue? So this is a, an unusual case where there wasn't a particular applicant that was uh, a thought of the uh, council member who sponsored the motion, council member Banks, who uh, he himself is uh, someone who uh, uh, practices target practice. And I guess he is anticipating potentially um, that there could be a location in New Orleans. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, for staff about this zoning document. If there are no further questions, uh, we will continue on into our, and with our agenda. Uh, zoning docket 1921 and zoning docket 2021 um, has been removed from our agenda. So we'll continue on to zoning docket 2521. Zoning Docket 2521 is a request by Couples Creating Opportunities, LLC, for a zoning change from an HURD2 Historic Urban Two-Family Residential District to an HUB1A Historic Urban Neighborhood Business District for a property located at 302 Olivier Street. The subject property is located in the Algiers Point neighborhood on the West Bank of New Orleans. The site is comprised of two lots of record fronting Pelican Avenue and Olivier Street with a combined square footage of approximately 5,683 feet. The proposed zoning change to an HUB1A Historic Urban Neighborhood Business District would allow the property to be utilized as a principal bed and breakfast, a use prohibited in the site's current zoning district. The subject property is currently improved with one historic structure dating from the middle of the 19th century. It has been used for various purposes over the decades, having served as a Masonic temple, dance hall, police station, tax assessor's office, and a reporter's court, according to historic Sanborn maps. Most recently, the structure has been used as a four unit multifamily dwelling. The applicant is seeking to redevelop the existing fourplex into a principal bed and breakfast with five guest rooms, including one room for the operator, a requirement for this use. The structure would undergo renovation to convert the structure to a single family residence, a prerequisite to use the structure as a principal bed and breakfast. The zoning change is logical because it recognizes that the structure is distinct from most other properties in the vicinity. While most of the surrounding structures were originally built and have solely been used for residential purposes, the structure was used for a number of non-residential purposes for nearly a century. The zoning change would revise the property zoning to more closely align with its land use history. 
The particular zoning district requested by the applicant, the HUB1A district, is designed to accommodate historic non-residential structures. This district is typically reserved for single corner parcels, mostly in residential context, contexts, such as the property in question. It permits uses that typically serve the neighborhood, including coffee shops, restaurants, and retail stores, all of which can provide valued neighborhood services. The proposed use for the property should minimal impact on the surrounding area as a district is intended for low intensity, non-residential uses that often serve as assets to their neighborhoods. In the immediate, the zoning change is required as requested to facilitate a residential use as a five guest room principal bed and breakfast with one guest room reserved for the operator, first converting the structure to a single family residence. Therefore, a principal bed and breakfast with four guest rooms should have a similar or lesser impact than the property's current use as a four unit multifamily structure. For these reasons, the staff recommends approval of zoning docket 2521. All right, thank you. Um, do we have the applicant or representative present for zoning docket 2521? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please state your name and address um, uh, for the record and your association. Hi, my name is Shawanda Pore. Um, I currently live at 15, 5711 Berkeley Drive in New Orleans, Algiers. Um, the property in question is in Algiers Point, um, 302. I, 302 Olivier, I am a member of Couples Creating Opportunity and I serve as the representative for feedback for this project. Thank you, you have three minutes. Okay, so I just wanted to um, take the time to thank you for listening um, to our proposed zone change. Um, we've been participating with the neighbors in regards to our project. Um, we do have some neighbors um, that live in the point area that has opposed our project, but mostly the residents within the vicinity of our project. Um, we've worked very strongly with them to answer any of their questions that they may have in regards to um, our project. Um, two areas of concern, well actually three areas of concern that have come up has been um, noise, parking, and the um, having the property manager on site. And so I think we've tried our best to mitigate those. Um, we don't expect that parking would be a major issue in the area because the property is currently um, a fourplex and considering that there are two people um, potentially in each one of the apartments that, that would put us at eight parking spots. Um, we also do, do not feel that um, having this as a bed and breakfast, most people would usually use um, some sort of shared service or the ferry or a taxi to come to the property. Um, in regards to the um, property manager being on site, um, we are able to utilize one of the bedrooms as this um, place for the property manager, but we also are looking at an alternative option of using the garage, which is at the back of the property, converting that into an efficiency apartment as well. So we think that in, in regards to noise, we've put together a policy, a good neighbor policy. Um, all of the owners of CCO, which um, are actually five couples, um, are residents of Louisiana and live in some close vicinity to the, pro um, the property. So we do anticipate that we will be there very often. And so there, if there are any concerns with the neighbors that we would be able to address those um, pretty immediately, but also having the property manager there on site. So we hope that you will um, agree with us and approve this project as favorable. Um, we will continue to work with our neighbors just as we've spoken with them and have addressed. Um, it aligns with the neighborhood and the zoning request as um, Rachel mentioned. Um, it sits on a corner. It has prior um, commercial use as the Masonic Hall. I mean, if you look at the picture of the property, it does not have any windows. Um, so we are actually working with the historical district in an effort to change that. Um, because it was a commercial property and now we're trying to put it into a sort of commercial use. And so we're working with local and state historical development um, departments in order to ensure that the property is in relevance to the neighborhood and that it will be a great addition to the neighborhood. So thank you so much for listening to our docket item. Commissioners, do you have any questions uh, for the applicant representative 
um, or staff at this time as it pertains to this document? This is Commissioner Wittry, I do. Go ahead, Commissioner. Would having the property manager on site then satisfy the principal bed and breakfast requirements? Yes. And, and this may be a question for staff. Would the zoning and safety and permits allow for the garage to be con um, converted to an apartment? So I can speak to that. Um, actually, currently it does not. Um, from advisement from staff, um, we were um, told to seek the zone change first, and then we would actually have to ask for a variance to have the garage converted. So then it would be a total of five units there, one for the property manager in the back per se, and then the four units um, for the bed and breakfast in the main house? It would be five inside the main house in the um, garage as the um, property manager. And, and is in the application, was there also um, a proposal to do some new construction as well on the lot? So the house is, um, in deteriorating condition. It actually, currently there's one tenant. Um, all of the rest of the remaining house is totally gutted. Um, it, it has current um, historical violations because of the, um, the, the construction that the previous owner was trying to do without a permit. So the house requires a total renovation. So would you be adding any new construction, like adding to the footprint of the property, of um, the current structure? The only thing that um, some may consider is adding is a porch to the side. But if you look at the original historical um, elevations of the property, it actually had a bump out um, in its original condition. Um, so in the history of the property, that part was removed. And so we're looking to add that back as a porch. Thank you. I loved looking at those photos. It was really beautiful to see. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for including them in the application or maybe the staff did included them. I don't have any other questions at this time. Okay. All right. Are there any other questioners, questions from any other commissioner? Commissioner Brown, if, uh, if I may. Um, thank you. And um, this is a beautiful building. Um, did you say that there were going to be five units for guests and if approved a number six on the rear where the garage is for the uh, owner operator or the operator? So if we, um, you know, we would like to seek to get a variance um, after this zoning, if we, we, if we are approved for the zoning change, um, currently the way that the property exists um, in the floor plans that we had done, it's five units with five in-suite bathrooms. Um, and so we seek to, if we're not able to get the variance, then we will use the third floor guest bedroom as the, as the property manager if not, we also would like to seek to have the garage changed to a carriage house that will be a one bedroom efficiency. I'm sorry, the last part of what you said, I missed it. If So if we do get the zone change, we are going to seek a variance to have the garage right. um, converted into a one bedroom efficiency. If we're not, um, we will have five bedrooms in the house and the garage will stay as is. Oh, okay. Um, so the business plan works both ways with giving up one of the, those units potentially as a rented space um, so that it is totally dedicated to the operator to live there full time. Um, yes. So the, the fit, so actually the house is three levels. And so there is a um, bedroom with um, suite that's on the third floor that can be utilized for the operator. And, and that calculation has been made uh, in the business model, worst case scenario, if that needs to be used for that purpose. Yes, ma'am. Okay.
And if I may, for the staff, um, if this owner decides that this is not a project they want to take on and they still have a zoning change or a future owner, um, what uses under the um, HUB1A are permitted? Give me one second, on, I'll pull it up. So in the HUB1A district, um, do you want to know specifically commercial uses or residential as well? Any, any uses that, the, I guess the, the ones I'm most interested in are the higher impact or the um, uses that could affect neighbors who seem very concerned about this being, um, you know, um, a more intense use than it currently is. Um, so in the HUB1A district, uh, short-term rental, small and large are both permitted uses. Those both require homestead exemption. Um, art gallery, art studio, permitted uses, catering kitchen, um, small child care center, um, financial institution, grocery store, office, and these are just permitted by right uses. Um, personal service establishment, pet daycare service, a specialty restaurant, standard restaurant, retail goods establishment, a small box variety store, tattoo parlor, government offices, um, let's see. Those are the most of the commercial um, and higher impact residential uses that would be permitted by right in that district. And those would not, and you know, just to just for the record, those none of those require further action by any body. Those are permitted. Should the zoning change go through, um, that's correct. Thank you. All right. So at this time, are there any other questions for the staff or applicant? in regards to zoning docket 2521. Commissioner Wittry has two more questions. So just to be clear, you would have to have a homestead exemption to have the large and short STR um, in moving forward. That's my first question. And my second one would be, I know somewhere in the application, I read that there was possibly a gift shop. Um, I'm just wondering if that is still part of the plan or if that's not. So I, um, this is Shawanda Puri again. Um, so it's actually opposite of what you, um, the question you asked. Um, we had to seek to get this because currently the way that the zoning exists, we are able to have an accessory bed and breakfast with the property as is without a zone change. Um, it came into question to get the zone change because none of the owners of the property um, would be able to obtain a homestead exemption for this property. So hence this um, request for zone change because the principal bed and breakfast, as long as we have an operator or property manager on site, then and Then the second question you asked about the gift shop, um, are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, because my internet keeps going out because of the weather. Um, so the goal is to have the gift shop on, um, if you're looking at the property onto the left side, that bump out. Um, and that's in an effort not only to be um, fiscally sound, um, adding um, income to the property, to, but also to um, highlight the arts of that neighborhood. So we've in the um, neighborhood participation program, we definitely reached out to all of the artists in the neighborhood as an effort to showcase their artwork in the gift shop. And so those, because the house also, in addition, that may not have been mentioned, the house is currently on the walking, the Algiers walking tour as a historical landmark. Thank I have you. one more question for Ms. Poray. If uh, Commissioner Wittry is finished, I forgot to ask this earlier. You mentioned that none of the owners 
has more than a, I guess there are four owners or five owners There's have more than a 20% interest in the property. Um, do any of them live in the immediate neighborhood? Um, so none of them live in Algiers Point, but I personally live in Algiers. And but you, you're business. not, you're, you're representing them. You're not a, a, an owner. Yes, I am an owner. My oh, okay. I, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Are there any, any more questions for the applicant or staff as it relates to zoning doctor 2521? All right, Ms. Paul Wright, uh, thank you so much. Um, we'll continue to move on with the agenda to subdivision docket 7420. Uh, this is Stephen, I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, this is an application by um, the Longview Foundation that uh, is made in an effort to essentially undo a 1999 subdivision that took a rear residential lot, incorporated it into the grounds of the, of the Longview facility. Um, and essentially this re-subdivides that residential lot back out of the Longview grounds uh, such that it would be available for sale. And it, this is done in conjunction with a recent sale um, and could be redeveloped for residential use. So uh, if you look at the survey shown on the slide, you'll see that there's this relatively small rectangular lot towards the uh, rear of, or the, the upper part of the survey. That That is essentially lot G, which existed as a separate single family residential lot from the Longview grounds. In 1998, it was acquired by Longview and in 1999, resubdivided into the Longview site. Longview is now selling that to a, a private company for separate development and is doing this uh, subdivision to recreate that lot to enable that sale. Um, a technical note uh, is that this lot historically fronted on Garden Lane, which um, extends out to Metairie Road. The portion of, and this is really at the dead end of Garden Lane, the portion of Garden Lane that fronts the lot was done away with as part of the 1999 subdivision. So this new lot would front on a paved roadway that is functionally part of Garden Lane, but is no longer part of the right of way. And so the applicant is requesting a waiver of the subdivision regulations to allow um, the new lot to not have frontage on a dedicated street. It would have frontage on the roadway that ultimately leads to Garden Lane. Uh, the, the staff is supportive of this proposal as it essentially reintroduces the historic condition and recommends approval with one waiver, uh, excuse me, tentative approval with one waiver and three provisos. Okay, um, do we, is the applicant from uh, uh, president or a representative? Um, yes, good afternoon. Uh, Chip Lyons, 201 St. Charles Avenue, New Orleans, Louisiana, here on behalf of the applicant, uh, Viscount, and also Longview, uh, and uh, available to answer any questions. We are uh, have no comments on the staff report and appreciate their recommendation. We're fine with the provisos. And as um, Stephen pointed out, again, the, the goal here is to put this property uh, back to its, uh, the, the smaller property being resubdivided back to its uh, historic residential use and basically uh, go back to what the status of the properties were in the late 90s prior to this property being acquired by Longview. It's now been, uh, is being, has been sold by Longview and um, by count is uh, ready to proceed with construction of a new residence on this property subject to getting this resubdivision uh, through the process. Uh, um, and again, happy to answer any questions that anyone has. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, do you have any questions uh, for the subdivision document? for the staff or for the representative um, that's present. 
Commissioner Whitry has a question. After the resubdivision, will the address still remain or will the address be 17 Bamboo Road? So the historically the address was 14 Garden Lane, I believe, and as part of the subdivision process, an address would be assigned. I don't know offhand if it's the same address, but there would be a new address uh, assigned. Thank you. Any further questions? The applicant or staff for the subdivision document. If there are no further uh, questions, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chip. Um, and we'll continue on to subdivision docket 1421. Thank you. Subdivision docket 1421 is a request by 1400 Barone LLC to subdivide lot BB4 into lots 42 through 49 and existing lot BB1 into proposed lots 1 through 37 P, which would be a pocket park and a private street in an MU2 high intensity mixed use district in the central city neighborhood. This request proposes 45 new residential lots of record across two city squares, square 240A and 241, which are bound by Martin Luther King Boulevard, Barone Street, Arado Street, and Carondelet Street. In addition, the proposed subdivision would reinstate connection to Talia Street, bifurcating squares 240A and 241. The site considered is the former Browns Dairy distribution and manufacturing plant. The subdivision proposal is being considered in conjunction with zoning docket 421, a text amendment to amend articles five and 18 of the comprehensive zoning ordinance, which was considered by the city planning commission on January 12th, 2021. This proposal is also accompanied by subdivision docket 1221 and subdivision docket 1321, two minor subdivisions, which would create eight additional lots on the site, resulting in 53 lots in total. The lots proposed through the proposed subdivision considered today vary in size and dimension, and most are non-conforming in regard to minimum lot area per dwelling unit um, uh, related to the bulk and yard regulations in the MU2 high intensity mixed use district per article 15.3A1 table 15-2 of the CZO. And therefore the approval of the subdivision is contingent on whether city council approves the Brown Stary affordable home ownership district as described in zoning docket 421 and council motion M-20-401 which would provide relief from the bulk and yard regulations for this area. Therefore, final approval of the subdivision proposal cannot be granted at this time, which is refle reflected in the staff's propo proposed provisos. The staff has also included several provisos to ensure compliance with standards regarding street and right-of-way improvements regulated by the subdivision regulations. However, finding that the proposal would restore the former street pattern, improve the urban design of an area which is currently underutilized and enable the adaptive reuse of a former industrial site. The staff finds the proposal generally supports the goals of the master plan and therefore staff recommends tentative approval of subdivision docket 14-21 subject to two waivers and 12 provisos. All right, thank you. Um, do we have a representative present from uh, 1400 uh, Barone? Uh, yes. Uh, excuse me, uh, Commissioner Stewart. I need to recuse myself. Okay. All right, please let the record reflect that Commissioner Wittry is recusing herself on the zoning docket 1421. Um, and at this time, now, Mr. Hank, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. And Thank you uh, to the city planning staff for the staff report on this resubdivision. Sorry about that. Um, th thank you for the, for the staff report. Um, we agree with the findings of the staff report and um, support the uh, suggested tentative approval of the major resubdivision to create the uh, uh, housing lots, the 53 lots or technically I guess 41 lots that are under zoning docket 1421. Um, so, so thank you for that. We have no um, major comments. Um, the waivers are make sense to us 
And um, the provisos, again, uh, seem generally fine, particularly those that uh, refer to conformance with DPW and sewage and water board and other standards relating to the reconstruction of um, Thalia Street. Um, I do have a question about one proviso and a potential request about another that I'd like to offer just for conversation. Um, proviso number six is about the right of way improvements. And it suggests uh, in the way that it's written that the street improvements must be complete before the subdivision is approved. Is that the intent or does DPW need to approve the design of the street to be consistent with DPW standards prior to approval of the, uh, uh, of the subdivision or resubdivision? Um, so that's a question with regards to proviso number six. Um, and then proviso number 11 refers to landscaping and street trees. Um, we're fine with that proviso, but I do want to point out where the uh, street is adjacent to a uh, lot P, which we're going to construct as a park. We may want some relief or modification from the street tree standard so that the street trees can be integrated with the landscape design of the adjacent park, uh, but we'll still effectively landscape the street. Um, other than that, um, everything else looks good. And, and thank you very much for the work thus far. Thank you so much. Um, staff, can you speak to uh, what the applicant brought up in Proviso 6 and 11, please? Uh, Cindy, I can take this if you prefer. So, and and bear with me a second. I'm reopening the document, um, which I inadvertently closed. Okay, so basically the way it works for street construction, either public or private street, um, the approval is in three phases. One is tentative, which is what's happening today. The second is preliminary, and then the third is final. Before the second step preliminary, uh, DPW has to approve the construction drawings for the street infrastructure, as does Sewage and Water Board. Um, at that point, the improvements are made or bonded. Um, and they have to be uh, completed, inspected, and accepted prior to final approval. So the construction and joint construction occurs between preliminary and final approval. The, the point of that procedure is really to ensure that, uh, number one, even if it's a private street, it has to be built to city standards, and, and two, to ensure that the subdivision is complete with the improvements such that, you know, lots are not sold before there is street access. So to answer the question, yes, uh, Proviso 6 needs to be completed uh, before final approval. Um, the other question was about the landscape plan. The, the landscape plan generally requires that street trees be planted on both the new street and the existing street surrounding the site. The Department of Parks and Parkways approves that landscape plan. So, you know, the, the proviso is not intended to discourage creative approaches. And if there is an integrated landscape plan that accounts for lot P, which is sort of the private garden or landscape space, I'm sure uh, Parks and Parkways would be acceptable to a landscape plan that responds to that sort of unique condition. So. Yes, there has to be street trees, but I wouldn't view it as prohibitive of uh, something that inc incorporated lot P as well. Okay, thank you. Um, one question, Stephen, about Proviso 6 and the street construction and, and as it pertains to final approval. Um, how will that, from, from a timing standpoint, how will that impact our ability to get building permits for lots either facing existing streets or lots facing the private street. We'd like to be able to construct, have a building permit and construct homes on lots concurrent with the street construction and or construct lots on Carondelet, Arado and Barone prior to completing street construction. So we just need to know that we can have a, a legal lot upon which we can get a building permit. Yeah, got it. I, I think that's a, that's a good point. Um, the intent is not to prevent um, building permits from being issued to lots that face existing streets. And so I don't see a problem with modifying that proviso to basically spell that out explicitly that permitting for lots fronting the proposed street cannot happen until after 
the roadway is constructed and final approval occurs, but that, and, and because you're kind of phasing this a little bit, I'm trying to think aloud here as, yeah. as to the mechanics of that, but, but I think conceptually uh, we can put in language there that makes clear that uh, lots that front existing streets can be permitted prior to the whole ball of wax being completed. Okay, that's very that's important for us and, and very helpful. And I would also request that we be able to permit um, lots on the private streets so long as the design of the private street is approved and construction is underway. And then getting their certificate of occupancy on those homes would be dependent upon completing the street. So we do want to have the opportunity or the option to build houses facing the future Thalia Street concurrent with building that street. Yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily think that's problematic. The, the regulations are presuming a totally greenfield site where you can't even get to the lots until the street right. exists. Here, you functionally got a street. So uh, I, I don't see a problem with with uh, allowing that. Okay, that, sound, that sounds great. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll defer to you on what the process is to edit that proviso, but thank you for that. All right, and uh, proviso number 11. Well, so we address both six and 11. Um, are there any other questions from any other commissioner um, for subdivision docket 1421? All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Heck for your time. Um, and we will continue on inside agenda on to um, the, last, the last item, which is a request for a CPC interpretation of the subdivision regulation pursuant to section 1.7 of the subdivision regulation and reconsideration of SD um, 11720. So, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and take this one. Um, good afternoon. Um, this is um, continuation of um, the rather unusual um, application that, uh, we addressed at our last meeting. Um, and I wanna start by apologizing for um, what may have been perceived as a, a lack of preparation by staff. Um, there's a very good reason for that. Um, and that is that it is highly unusual for, um, for a property or a subdivision that is up for administrative approval to have been challenged and to have not been ratified. And in fact, um, in, in surveying all the existing staff and even some former uh, staff members um, going back over 20 years, um, nobody can recall um, an administrative approval ever being challenged at the ratification stage. So, um, so I just put that out there as, as again, to, to apologize for, um, for the, uh, for last meeting. Um, but, following last meeting, we went back and took a look at it just to make sure that, that things were handled appropriately because a lot of different questions came up um, that we weren't able to answer definitively at the last meeting. And so um, based on that further review, um, staff is recommending, um, first of all, that you all make some interpretations of um, the language of the subdivision regulations, which is not clear. Um, that's one of the reasons why we are in the process of uh, amending the subdivision regulations, um, but it is just not clear. Um, and number two, to reconsider the, um, the denial of uh, subdivisions 11720 in light of the interpretations and in light of the new uh, information that, that's forthcoming today. So, I'm gonna to try to be as brief as I can, um, but I want to, um, I, just going through the language and I, and I spelled it out in the, in the memorandum that I wrote, but it, from, from the very clear language of the subdivision regulations, um, the administrative approval process and particularly uh, the process outlined in 3.2.2, .2, which is policy B is, um, it's very straightforward. And the impl implication there um, from our perspective is that if the requirements or the, the, the standards for um, 
being eligible for policy B are met, then it is not only should we approve it, but it shall be approved is, is the name or is the, is the language used in the, in the subdivision regulation. So, um, so it, it seems that the, that the implication of this whole process is to identify those minor subdivisions that are inherently approvable and that we create and that there is a process for um, that that is simpler than the standard process that moves them forward towards approval. Um, in other words, the language is very clear that if if A is done, then we shall do B. If the criteria are met, then we shall issue the notification letter of administrative approval. Um, and then following that, if the following, if the subsequent materials are submitted, then we shall issue the final approval. Um, that, that's the language of the, of the ordinance. Um, and contrary to a number of the comments from last meeting, um, there is absolutely no discretion on the part of staff. Um, the shall is is mandatory um, and that's reinforced in the definitions um, section of the of the ordinance. So as specific and as clear as the administrative approval process is in the subdivision regulations, the process around ratification is is the exact opposite. There is absolutely no guidance. There is a reference um, subject to the ratification of the of the commission, um, but there's nothing um, that provides guidance about when that happens, about what is the substance of the review, about um, on what the basis is for uh, the CPC uh, refusing to, ver to ratify. And then if the CPC chooses not to ratify, what happens then? Um, because th there is absolutely no guidance in the subdivision regulations um, for any of that. And, and, and as I'll state again later, our suggestion is that the review, because of the clear language about the process itself, the review should be limited to, does the application um, meet the standards for eligibility for, for um, policy B? And therefore, if it does, then the subdivision language, regulations language should be followed, which is it shall be approved. Um, to, to kind of allay any question about whether the proposal fits squarely into policy B. Um, policy B is very simple. Um, it uh, basically says um, it authorizes administra uh, administrative approval uh, of plans which either meet the requirements of the subdivision regulations or meet all of the following conditions. Um, this is a subdivision plan that meets all of the requirements of the subdivision regulations and it is fewer than five lots, it's five or fewer lots. So it, so it is a minor subdivision and falls into policy B. So according to, again, the language, um, we should be um, approving this or we, we should have approved it as administrative subdivision. Um, so the lots comply with um, all applicable um, subdivision regulation and CZO regulations in terms of size, shape and design. Um, it eliminates an irregular multi frontage lot uh, and replaces it with five conventional lots that are consistent with the historic pattern of the neighborhood. Um, as to the comments that came in the last meeting, um, virtually all of them are about zoning, and which is, which is handled in a separate process from subdivision regulations. Um, that's why there are two processes, um, one to deal with the um, with the lot configuration and one to deal with the use. And so the majority of the issues raised at the last meeting were about use. And there is a, um, a process in place for challenging use decisions. Um, again, contrary to the comments that there is no public input permitted um, if this um, subdivision moves forward. As I included in my memo, um, and in the supplemental materials. Um, comments were made back in May, um, suggesting that what they were proposing was a conditional use um, and that they would have to go through the conditional use process. Uh, those comments were amended, um, basically saying to verify 
that um, verify that the if they are proposing to do the subdivision, then verify that each of the buildings on each of the separate lots will be a separately run hotel, independent hotel with separate lobby, separate staff and, and operated independently from each other. Those responses, um, the, the applicant has not responded to any of those comments um, based on the record. And so those questions are still open. At the time that those questions are answered, either affirmatively or negatively, there are processes available for um, for bringing that to a, a public forum. If the Department of Safety and Permits accepts the responses and says, yes, this is compliant with the zoning ordinance, then the neighbors can appeal that decision through the zoning appeal process. And that process goes to the Board of Zoning Adjustments, um, which will have a public hearing um, and air uh, the, um, the, the interpretation and whether or not it was a valid interpretation of the zoning ordinance. If, if the Department of Safety and Permits says, no, this is not compliant, then they would have to go through the conditional use process. So the process that we are currently undertaking, which is the subdivision process is not the, um, it's not the best um, process to address zoning issues, um, especially when there are, are other processes available to address that. Um, the final question that came up was about the 60 day deadline. And that's, I think what um, the conversation about which uh, may have prompted you all to um, move for denial as opposed to a public hearing if you were um, going to do a public hearing. Um, and in looking at the language, I think it's pretty clear that the, um, the, the language that talks about an action on, on the final plan within 60 days is, is, is meant to do exactly what the staff is doing. It, it puts the limit on when that initial um, administrative approval, the cert certified approval um, through the notification letter. So that's the way we've been um, implementing it for years. Um, there's nothing to suggest that that means the final action on the subdivision needs to happen within 60 days. Um, that would be almost impossible to enable all of the different things that can happen um, in this process. Um, it, it, it just couldn't happen. Um, and so um, I think that um, one of the uh, recommended interpretations is that you all interpret um, administrative approval as the act, which is sufficient to stop the 60 days from running. Um, as far as our specific requests, you'll see that there are uh, five particular interpretations. Um, and they are really to kind of reinforce everything that I've said, um, that the subdivision regulations, um, that, that if um, they're, they meet the if the, an application meets the criteria for administrative approval, um, they're presumed to be entitled to final approval provided that um, those subsequent actions take place. Um, that the issuance of the notification letter um, satisfies the 60 day commission deadline, that the, CD, the CPC ratification of an administrative approval should take place uh, prior to the issuance of the final approval. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and the, the scope of the review on administrative approvals is limited to um, the question of whether it is eligible for administrative approval. And that in the event that the commission elects not to ratify, staff is suggesting that um, if, if a application is not ratified, it should be pulled and scheduled for a public hearing on whether it is um, appropriately at the, um, at the uh, being, be, being considered as an administrative approval. Because if it's not appropriate for administrative approval, it should go through the full process um, as spelled out in the, in, the, um, in the subdivision regulation. So pulling it out and denying it 
is really contrary to um, any kind of due process for um, the application. Um, it should be, um, if it's not something that can be administratively approved, it should be approved as a regular subdivision after public hearing and um, all of the required notice. Um, so based on all of that, our request is to um, have you, um, or, and based on these interpretations, our, our request is that subdivision 11720 be um, reconsidered and that the vote to deny be rescinded and instead um, have the commission uh, take one of the following two actions. One is to go ahead and ratify the application or to direct the staff to schedule a public hearing pursuant to 3.1.3 to give all parties, including the applicant, the opportunity to be heard prior to the commission's consideration of whether to ratify the subdivision. Um, back for a note on the, um, the timing of the ratification. Um, the practice has been, again, for as long as everyone can remember, for the ratification to occur after the final approval has been granted. Um, every single um, list of subdivisions up for ratification have been granted the final approval already. Um, in this case, that is the case as well. And so um, we have a situation where um, a denial or a... Um, a, um, yeah, a denial would be possible after that final approval was granted. And, they, and again, um, I think that what we are recommending that you all interpret is that we as staff move our process so that the, the, um, the ratification take place after the issuance of the notification letter and before the final approval. Um, it still may cause some conflict with the language of the ordinance because there are some applicants who are immediately ready for final approval once the notification letter is granted. And um, the language in the ordinance suggests that we need to issue those final approvals within six days. So um, there may be some conflict there as well, but, um, but having the opportunity for you all to ratify um, before the final approval, I think it makes a lot more sense um, than the process that has uh, been in place for a number of years. Um, that's the extent of my uh, presentation. Um, I'm happy to have any questions if you have any. All right, thank you, Bob, so much for um, your historical perspective and also presenting us with that memo and recommendations um, for- Commissioner, Commissioner Stewart, can I, before the presentation by the applicant, can I ask, a, a, uh, Executive Director Rivers, a question on his comments? Absolutely, go ahead. Uh, um, so, Bob, can you amplify a little bit on the um, on the issue of ratification? I, I followed everything you said, and it obviously is a really complicated uh, issue that you've tried to lay out for us really uh, clearly. Um, can, you, you said that there, it, there was a lack of clarity on the issue of ratification. Can you give us a little more detailed explanation of um, the process of ratification and how it fits into the overall process of, of an administrative subdivision, um, wh when it happens and, and typically what, it, what the ratification, uh, if it's administrative, then it, it, it's, as you said, it's, it's kind of, um, it's, it's black and white, so to speak. Um, and so what's the role of ratification of the commission? What are the factors we're allowed to consider? Um, uh, if, it's, if it's A, it has to be B, then what's the, what, what are the permissible things that the commission can consider in ratifying something that you're saying is black and white? So, um, so I guess what we are suggesting, one, is that the subdivision regulations are silent on every question that you just asked. Um, and so it's going to fall to you all to interpret what that means. And so what we are suggesting um, is that the only interpretation that really makes a logic or has some logic to it um, in order to make everything work in the subdivision regulations is to have the ratification um, occur after the staff issues the notification letter 
um, because of, because you need to have some action of the staff to ratify, right? And so that's the first staff action that is um, that is um, provided in this whole process. Um, and that because of the clear language of the of what is eligible, what the what the criteria for approval are, that the 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 ratification be um, either be a the way it's operated for years, which is just a a formal approval, um, or if there's going to be an issue about whether something should be on that list or not, it, it should be about the eligibility question. In other words, that the, the only criteria that we are basing our decision about in putting the application on that list that is up for ratification is if it is five or below and it meets all the regulations. And so right those up. are the two things that I think should be the substance of the ratification inquiry. In other words, you're suggesting, recommending that we interpret the ratification to be a, an evaluation on our part of whether the staff followed the administrative rules correctly. Um, if, it had yes. six, <laughs> if it had six lots and you had done it as an administrative subdivision, we would say, no, that's wrong. We won't ratify it because you can only do it administratively for five lots, for example. But that you're Correct. suggesting we be confined to the same criteria that you were con that the staff is confined to in and and basically ratify that you applied the specific rules correctly. That is what we are recommending. Yes. Okay. May I ask a question following up on what Commissioner Steak just said? Mm -hmm. um, so any, any issues say that, that you know, if, if all the criteria were met for administrative procedures, then impact of any use of that would not factor into any of our decisions on whether to ratify or not. So, so a public if, hearing, that's what I'm getting that you, if I may just extend my question just, at the end of what you said was our choices were to ratify or number two, direct the staff to a public hearing. But I mean, I'm, what I'm thinking the public hearing is, is to hear from neighbors on the impact, which in this case, if we're just ratifying based on whether staff followed our procedures or the, or the administrative rules, then what, what would we get from the public hearing I guess I just, I wanna make sure that, you know, that due process thing sort of strikes a nerve with me. And, you know, if that's outside of what we are allowed to do, then, um, so it, I don't know if I sure. articulate. No, I, I, I think I understand your question. And I guess the way that we're looking at it is um, in this particular um, circumstance that, the public hearing would be if there's a question as to whether something should be ratified or not, or if you decide not to ratify something, then either there should, in, in the interest of due process for the applicant, there should be a hearing where oh. that is, is vetted um, and the applicant should have an opportunity to come and um, and 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 state their case. Um, otherwise, you know, I think there were fifty or sixty minor subdivisions on the on the application. If if it was if the expectation was that the applicant has to attend that ratification meeting in order to be able to state their case, if it's pulled out. Then that's basically saying we need you know sixty more people to show up at the meeting, which I, I don't think is right. the um, is the intent. But but that's in that case there may be other scenarios where 
Um, and, and again, the language is, is kind of fuzzy because it says that if a public hearing is held, the commissioners don't have to attend, right? So I, I, I think that there's, um, there's you know, the, the possibility that it may be to gather further information on a larger, um, on a larger um, subdivision or on a major subdivision. Um, it could be to, um, to gather information um, for something that is gonna be impactful. And um, I, I, I guess, and, and again, because of the lack of clarity in the, in the subdivision regulation, there just isn't anything in the actual decision-making process that speaks to impact of what the use is. Right, it, it, it is the subdivision or re regulations are written to, um, to have the effect that if that, that anything that is five or fewer is that results in five or fewer lots is not a major thing. And therefore okay. it, it should be approved. Um, I will yeah. note that the state enabling legislation, that number is 10 and there is no ratification component in the state legislation. So, um, so I, I, I think that ours is more restrictive than, um, than the state allows for. Um, but nevertheless, I do think, you know, as far as the, what is the purpose of the hearing would be to, to make sure that the applicant is um, afforded due process in order to um, vet the issues that come up. Correct. Okay. I think I'm, I, I'm allowed. I think other commissioners want to ask a question. But I have you. one follow up small question while you're, uh, uh, isn't there a size lim limit also? So can you give us the, all of the criteria for administrative subdivision under this uh, 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 policy? Is it, it's under five, it's five or fewer lots and isn't, sure. it, isn't there an area li limitation also? It's, uh, so many acres or, or whatever, or is there not? No, there is not. So the distinction between a major subdivision and a minor subdivision is the number five. If it's five or fewer lots, then it's a minor subdivision. If it's five or more, then it's a major subdivision. Within, then you move to, of the universe of minor subdivisions, what are the approval processes that would apply, okay? And in the case where all of the subdivision regulations are met, that's a policy B, and that's that's eligible for um, for administrative approval if it's legitimately a minor subdivision and it's legitimately meeting all of the um, the requirements of the subdivision regulations. Good, thank you. That that answers my question. All right. Are there any further questions for uh, for Bob at this time? Commissioners, any other questions? All right. If there are no further questions, that concludes our agenda um, as printed and prepared for us at this time. I think uh, did the is the applicant present? And were yeah. they going to? Yes. Yeah, I think we have a. Hmm. Yeah, um, I don't know if that's proper, but don't we have an applicant for this we have an proponent? Right. So uh, uh, if uh, Commissioner Brown or Commissioner Steve, if you want to ask a, a question of the applicant. Um, or does he does he not get a three minutes as a proponent? Oh, OK. I see. This is not a regular docket. I would like to hear from uh, the applicant if that's OK. Um, okay. Is, do we need to? OK. Com uh, you can just ask. You, you can give him time. It's fine. It, this is a weird, very strange thing. Weird so, thing. Like okay. hear from him. Go ahead. If, if, yeah. if, if, if any of our legal questions, uh, if there's something you want to clarify, I would like to hear from the applicant, if that's okay. All right. So I have a quick question just before we hear from the applicant. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner. So are we being asked then to rescind the vote that we had had um, on this particular docket item, is that sort of the end result or we're asking and then to either ratify 
and or or I guess or schedule a public hearing on this particular docket item. I guess I'm just trying to figure out what's being requested of the commissioners uh, and the end result before the applicant speaks. So I, I can answer that. Yes, that that's exactly what you're being asked to do. That um, at the last meeting, um, a number of questions were raised about the uh, the proposal. And so instead of ratifying it with the other with with the other applications that were on that ratification list, the commission voted to remove it from that list. And then in determining what to do with it, um, there were some questions raised about possible impacts of deadlines. So rather than schedule it for a public hearing, the commission denied it. And so what we are suggesting today is that there is there that based on our research, there, there's a lot more information that you all should have considered before making a, a, a vote on denial. And, and that is on us for not having that information available to you um, at last week's meeting. So the subdivision regulations allow for a reconsideration at the next meeting. And so that's what we're requesting, that we are presenting um, the issue, the, the, the new information, um, asking you all to weigh in on some of the unclear language. And then based on all of that, um, reconsider your vote. Um, you can always choose not to and, and stick with the denial. Um, we're asking that you either ratify it or um, schedule it for a hearing so that there's, um, so that all the, the, the uh, due process um, considerations are addressed. And all the other resubdivisions were ratified in that vote. We're just talking specifically about this yes. one docket item. Yes. Okay, just trying to put it in layman terms for all of us. <laughs> Thank you. And then okay. Bob, if I can follow up and can you remind us about appeals or not appeals? If we, if we do follow the recommendation of staff mm -hmm. and end up ratifying then is that final and there and and the op opponents have no appeal rights or does it go to the city council there's so, no there's no appeal rights unless it's the applicant right that's what that's what i thought okay unless unless you all in rat in decision not to ratify say no this is not a minor subdivision this is a major subdivision right, right. and we are going to disapprove of it then because it would be a major subdivision, this, there would be the opportunity for um, to go to city council for the neighbors to appeal. But um, but if it's if it's if it's approved as a minor subdivision, then no, there is no appeal right um, for the neighbors. Okay, thank you. All right, so at this time, uh, I think Commissioner Brown was gonna lend time to the applicant um, just to hear from him. Um, but I think this uh, has, has been stated that this is more of a procedural issue um, for CPC. Um, so uh, Commissioner Brown, if you still wanna lend time to the applicant, we can hear from the applicant, but I think this is kind of just more on our side to go back and correct um, what happened during our last meeting. Commissioner Brown. Well, I can speak to that if if Kelly. I'm. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. Uh, I, you. I, I would like to hear from the applicant anyway, so I guess I'll take the pressure off of Kelly, and I'll. No, oh, I'm, I'm out and do it. Yeah, I, I would like to hear from the applicant too, if if the if the commission is, is can can allow some indulgence here, because um, I think that that this is a very confusing issue, and I think that I think that we since it appears that we might have done something that we need to correct, I think, and out of an abundance of caution, I think we should hear. Okay, so um, if the applicant, I think, believe he was present, are you still there? Yes, still here. All right, so um, so, so Peter, I, I'll, um, at this time, I'll spend three minutes to you um, to talk great. about um, the application. Great, great. Uh, commissioners, thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, it is unorthodox, and you know, we were sort of taken by surprise um, when we heard the news at the, at the on March 9th in the evening. But um, what I'd like to do is address a couple of points about the action that was taken by the CPC on March 9th. Um, but first, I think it's helpful to give you some context about this resubdivision. Um, 
we began to having discussions with CPC staff on in September of 2020. Uh, we submitted our application to the staff after many discussions and working through you know, whatever issues they were going to have uh, to make sure we conform with the regulations. We submitted the application in late September. Uh, we received an email from CPC staff on October 19th, 2020, indicating that our application was complete and that it was going to be circulated to all the other agencies that needed to review it. They would, of course, have 30 days to review it um, and get back with any comments. We worked through those comments. Um, we received a notification letter, which I think uh, Director Rivers uh, highlighted in his memo. Um, in this case, it was an email, but basically it was a notification email on December 17th, 2020. In that email, it indicated that it had been certified by the director. Um, and there were two attachments to that, one of which was the final declaration of title change, which represents a final approval under the regulation guidelines. Um, the owner, closed on the property uh, a few days later. And then the declaration of title change was, uh, was, was recorded on December 22nd, 2020, per again, per the regulation guidelines where it has to be recorded within 30 days. Now, I wanna touch on the timing of the commission's actions uh, because we, we disagree with uh, the director. We believe um, that the deadline is very clear. Um, I can draw your attention to section 3.15 entitled commission deadline, where it indicates that the commission shall act upon the final plan for a minor resub within 60 days after the official submission date, um, unless the subdivider agrees to an extension, the subdivider being uh, the owner of the property. Now the official submission date is defined in the, in the zoning regulations as um, for both major and minor resubs as the date of the submittal of the application. So the submittal of the application in complete form and that shall constitute the, the official submission dates. This is being pulled directly from the language of the regulations. To us, it's clear and unambiguous. The 60 days starts from the official submission date, uh, which again occurred on October 19th, 2020, when we got an email from the city planning staff telling us that we had a complete application. It was being submitted around to all the other agencies. Um, another very important uh, provision from the zoning regulations is section 8.1, which expounds further upon the uh, city planning's deadlines and, and how they have to meet them. Um, it highlights again that the final plan for minor resub divisions must be acted upon within 60 days of the official submission date. But the next provision is, is pertinent to this discussion. It says, if the commission fails to act to approve, conditionally approve or disapprove on the submitted plan within the stated period, such plan shall be deemed to be approved. So that's a, it is deemed to be approved and a certificate to the effect shall be issued by the commission on demand. Now, okay, 60 days from the official submission date is what it says in the regulations. And if you go back and do the math on that, March um, 9th, excuse me? It's about that conclusion time of, of three minutes for allocation to, to speak. Um, so there isn't another question uh, raised or time allotted by any of the commission at conclusion time. Could I just ask that he finishes that sentence on the date, please? Am I allowed to proceed? Yes. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Witchery asked that you finish your last uh, sentence. Yes. Um, basically, all I was going to say is that from the official submission date, it's 141 days. From Even if you look at the notification letter, which is the, the point in time that uh, the director points to as being substantive, it's still um, 82 days. So either way you look at it, you were, the 60 days has already elapsed. And in our opinion, this subdivision has been deemed approved by the own regulations of the City Planning Commission. All right, any questions for the applicant? I hope this is a real quick question, but I do. So you're saying that, that we don't necessarily need to act on anything we've done that we did, that what, what has happened thus far on the calendar has is deemed approval. Or would you, is, are you, one more, one more comment sure. from you. Yeah, so. I asked so, that Commissioner question. Brown, Brown, Commissioner Brown. Staff, oh, wait, rather than the applicant. Commissioner Mobley, um, Commissioner, hold on, <laughs> Commissioner Mobley. Uh, Commissioner Brown, I, I would say out of, out, out of respect for our staff and also legal that's present that that's not an appropriate uh, question for 
the applicant himself to answer. Okay, yeah, yeah I agreed. I, I agree. I'm, I'm sorry, I meant to uh, ask, no. I should ask the staff that question, how, our, right. our city attorney, so, uh, where that stands legally. I will, I will direct that question to, to Missy. And then I also uh, would just like to break up, I mean, during this time we've been dealing with a lot of other outside present issues such as COVID. Um, so I don't know if anything extension added to that timeline, with, which if anything passes a certain time frame uh, through the governor's order or anything else, even in which, you know, our meetings are supposed to be held uh, in person and we're doing it virtually. So um, I'll direct that question um, to Missy and then we'll go back. Uh, and I think uh, Commissioner Mobley uh, had a question. Uh, Missy? The, the subdivision deadlines are still in place because those were not specifically suspended and they're contained in state law. Um, all of the local guidelines have been suspended, but the subdivision um, deadlines have not been. So we, we have to follow those still, but if, the, uh, if, if an applicant agrees to a deferral, then we can do that. But that's usually only in the case of major subdivisions because those are the ones that come to public hearing. Um, and then what, what was the other question? I don't. Commissioner Mobley, you get, you get a, another question. My Outside. question was um, just to ask that the question be directed to uh, legal and staff. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Mobley. All right, so at this time now I'll ask to, to the applicant, are you open to a, a deferral on this matter? We are not. Okay. All right, any other questions for, um, for the applicant or staff as it relates to this, uh, this docket? All right, there's no further questions. Thank you uh, for your time, Mr. Connick. Um, right before um, we break for our recess, um, due to the weather, and some other circumstances, we have um, a few commissioners that won't actually uh, be coming back from recess, um, which kind of throws in the question if we're gonna maintain a quorum uh, for um, one docket item in particular. Um, so I'm gonna ask at this time, uh, commissioners, if we can suspend the rules when we come back from recess that we can actually hear um, the dockets out of order uh, to make sure that we can maintain a quorum so that we can uh, conduct business today. So is there a motion to suspend the rules so that so um, based on the chair's discretion, uh, we can hear his own docket so that we can maintain a quorum? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, would, I was gonna ask uh, before we take a motion on that, can we modify the amount of time that we step away uh, and shorten our break? No, we cannot do that because we advertise 30 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, I move that this Commissioner Lund move that we uh wait modify. Commissioner Lund are you the one that's recusing yourself oh, on that no. item <laughs> I don't want you making this motion though. thank you thanks Mr. I, I'll, I'll make the motion that we suspend the rules to uh allow the that docket item uh, chair to take a docket item out of order when we return from recess all right it's been moved by Commissioner Steve um uh, to suspend the rules to hear to get the chair discretion uh to hear um, the docket items out of order um, from the printed agenda. Is there a second to that motion? Can we can we amend that to sp specifically say which one? It's subdivision docket 1421. Good, I didn't have that, but yes. Subdivision and my motion accordingly. Okay, is there a second to that motion? Commissioner Flick second. Commissioner Flick has seconded um, that motion. Um, is there any further discussion on that motion? If not, I'll call the question, Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner Flick? Yes. Commissioner Lund? Missy, should I recuse myself? Can I vote on this? You can vote on this. It's yes. It's, it's, I just didn't want you making that. Commissioner Marshall? Yes. Commissioner Mobley? Yes. Commissioner Steig? Yes. Commissioner Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Wittry? Yes. Commissioner Weaver? Yes. All right, unanimous support for the motion. Um, at this time now, the time now is 2.59. Um, the chair will not entertain a uh, motion for a 30 minute recess. 
All right, Commissioner Lawn, I move that we uh, go into a 30 minute recess to consider public comment being submitted uh, with the, our meeting resuming at 3.30 p.m. Okay, is there a second to that motion? Which we will second. Uh, it's been moved by Commissioner Lawn for a 30 minute recess uh, reconvene at 3.30. It's been seconded by Commissioner Witcher. Is there any further discussion to that motion? If there's no further discussion to that motion, I'll call the question. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Flick? Yes. Commissioner Lawn? Yes. Commissioner Marshall? Yes. Commissioner Mobley? Yes. Commissioner Steve? Yes. Commissioner Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Witchery? Yes. Commissioner Weaver? Yes. All right, unanimous support for that motion. We are joined uh, to 3.30.
Okay, Commissioners, uh, the time now is 3.30. Um, so I'm going to ask if you're back to turn your cameras on so that we can take a roll call. Whoa, that was lightning. It looks like we're still waiting for a few more commissioners to join us so that we can come out of recess. Let's see, we have four. Was everybody expected back? Um, the only ones that we're not expecting back uh, is Commissioner Mobley. Uh, Commissioner Marshall said that he would um, hop on and try to make it before his his four. So Commissioner Weberg and Commissioner Woodtree, we're still waiting on. Paul, did we receive any uh, public comment? I haven't received an email uh, from Stephen. Okay. This is Stephen. We have a lot of public comment. Um, I'm about to email it to you in one second. All right, commissioners. Uh, in the meantime, as we uh, wait for those other commissioners to join, uh, once check your emails and once Steven sends that out, you can start reviewing public comment. Kelly, the dog's under the desk. <laughs> oh. All right, so now <clears throat> the time is uh, 3.33. Uh, so at this time, I'll call the roll call to record all commissioners that are present so that we can come out of recess. I'm um, starting with Commissioner Brown. Here. Commissioner Coming Flick. back. Commissioner Flick. Present. Commissioner Lund. Here. Commissioner Marshall. Commissioner Steig. Here. Commissioner Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Wittry. Yes. Yes. All right. So at this time now, I think we just received the email from Stephen of public comment. Um, if we want to start looking over that. Um, and based on just making sure that we maintain quorum, um, we took a vote. Mr. Chairman, we're only looking over the first 23 pages of public comments, correct? Right, but, okay. but, Thank but you. Before, look, before we get there, um, we're going to start with, uh, based on our last vote, uh, to, suspend, to, to, <clears throat> to suspend the rules, we're going to start with subdivision docket 1421. Um, so I'm not... So there are no, I don't see any public comments for zoning docket 1721. 1421? Uh, oh, 1721? No, 1421. Oh, sorry. I see at least one. On page six. All right. Okay. 
for subdivision docket 1421. There's a comment from Laura Guccione at 939 Montague Street in opposition to the application. This is insane without any public input. Our neighborhood is being destroyed by developers. As a lifelong New Orleanian and resident of the Bywater for over 20 years, I'm thinking about moving because of the trash, traffic, and noise. It's absurd how no one thinks about the people who actually live here year round and keep the city safe. Not sure if they're in order, but there's like there was another one. There's another one on page seven. Yeah, on page seven, there's another one by Carol. Okay. Um, Carol Gagnotti, 910 St. Rock Avenue. In opposition, please uphold the, I think this is, is labeled the wrong okay. one. I don't think this is for subdivision dock at 1421, but because it's in reference to 621 Elysian Fields. Okay. I'll, I'll just read it when we get to that. And I just want to make sure that we're not leaving any public time announcements. We're taking these out of order. So we should do that. So they're like it's that concludes uh, the public comment for uh, subdivision docket fourteen twenty one. Um, at this time, commissioners, um, you have a question for staff or a motion uh, for that document. Please. It says there's a lot of public comment. I'm sorry. We can mute all devices except for uh, commissioners. And also for the record, uh, Commissioner Witchery and also Commissioner Lund uh, are recusing themselves on this docket matter. All right, so Paul, uh, did you find any other um, comments for this for subdivision docket 1421? No, I do not see any others. All right, so that concludes the public comment. Uh, so commissioners, do you have a, a question for staff um, or a motion uh, for subdiv subdivision docket 1421. And Commissioner Stewart, if I could interject, um, the applicant requested revisions to Proviso 6 that would essentially allow building permits to be issued while street construction is ongoing. Um, and I have language I can suggest to that effect if, if it's desired by the commission. Yes, Stephen. Um, okay, so so if the intent is to allow uh, has construction to occur while the Thalia Street is being constructed, um, you would modify Proviso Six, and the existing language in the staff report would become Six A, and then you'd add Section Six B, which would say construction of structures may be permitted following preliminary approval and prior to final approval. However, certificates of occupancy shall not be issued until prior, uh, until following approval of the subdivision. Following final approval, I should say. Commissioner Stewart, may I weigh in with a question for uh, Stephen, for staff? So at, at this point, the, the public uh, comment portion has been closed. Um, so if there's no uh, uh, questions for, for you at this time, that portion is, is closed.
purpose of moving this forward, uh, I am going to make a motion to approve staff recommendation uh, with the modified proviso six and an understanding on the other proviso, I believe it was nine uh, around the green space and the greenery issue uh, that we um, uh, uh, understand the Parks and Parkways is going to have uh, an ability to have a say on that. So uh, I'm gonna make a motion with the two provisos that were, were requested amended by um, the applicant. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, we'll make a motion to approve as recommended by staff. Okay, Commissioner Weaver. Yes. Proviso 11. Yes. Just for clarity, I think this is proviso number 11. Um, Thank the, you. Say six, six and 11. Six and 11. I stand corrected. I, I accept the, the, the friendly amendment uh, from uh, 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 Commissioners Flick and Stewart. Yes. Uh, proviso 11 that will get uh, uh, feedback from other departments and then proviso six with the language uh, provided by staff, uh, otherwise approving staff recommendation. Okay. Um, that, that motion has been moved by Commissioner Weber for approval with uh, modification to proviso six and 11 um, pertaining to number six, pertaining to the language that was uh, given by Stephen. Um, is there a second to that motion? Commissioner Flick will second. All right. Um, uh, Commissioner uh, Flick has seconded that motion. Um, and just for a, a moment of cl clarity, I'm gonna exercise privilege to recognize uh, the applicant just to make sure to make sure that that so it's that motion is okay with him. I see his his hands is in the air. So I'm, at this time, I'm, I'm gonna allow you, Mr. Heck, uh, uh, 30 seconds. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Stewart. I I just like to clarify the proposed proviso 6B and confirm that the limitations on receiving a certificate of occupancy for a house pertains only to those lots fronting on the new street to be constructed so that lots fronting on existing streets can be built upon independent of the street construction. All right. Yeah, that, that was my intent in drafting that and we can modify the language to make that clear. Thank you. Okay, yeah, just limit it to the Thalia street fronting lots. Thank you. All right, thank you. So um, at this time, Commissioner Weaver has a, a motion for, for approval, given the clarity to uh, proviso number six and 11. Um, that motion was seconded by Co Commissioner uh, flick. If there's no further discussion um, on the motion, I'll call the question. Um, Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commission, Commissioner Flick. Yes. Commissioner Marshall. Uh, Commissioner Steve. Uh, yes. Commissioner Stewart. Yes. Commissioner uh, Weberg. Yes. All right. Unanimous so support uh, for uh, that motion and that motion is carried. And for the record, Commissioner Wittry and also Commissioner Lund uh, recused themselves on that docket matter. All right, so we'll move to the beginning um, of our agenda as printed as zoning docket 1721. And there are no public comments on that docket. There was no public comment. Uh, Stephen, can you remind us uh, all commissioners of uh, staff recommendation? Uh, this is the uh... The text amendment for the shooting gallery. Uh, so the staff recommended modified approval. All right. And I, just for just for the record, and, and staff, can you clarify this? This text amendment only allows for the use of identifying certain areas in which um, zoning zoning can recognize shooting shooting ranges, however, indoor or outdoor, it will still have to come before the commission, correct? So indoor uh, shooting ranges are recommended to be permitted uses in the C2, C3, light industrial and heavy industrial districts. Outdoor shooting ranges are recommended to be conditional use and authorized only in the heavy industrial district. All right, so at this time, are, are there any other questions for staff or a motion uh, by any commissioner to move forward? Motion to go against staff recommendation and a motion for denial. Is there a second to that motion? Is Brown will second for. Mm -hmm. 
Can we articulate why we're voting against this for the record, please? Commissioner Weaver, want to make sure I'm on. Uh, for what reasons are you asking me to, 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 to clarify that? Just, just, you know, it, you usually we say why we're going against the staff recommendation. Um, and we just really need to put that on the record because it's going to the council with that recommendation. And we just need some clarity on why. Yeah. So I think um, this was in front of us two meetings ago. And when it came in front of us, uh, we voted to move this, um, and and we did that uh, to honor uh, residents of the city um, who had been killed uh, at a gun range in Jefferson Parish um, as they were performing work and duty uh, uh, at a, a place of private employment. And we said we wanted to delay this um, to um, uh, come to a place where where we had a little more clarity and a little more space to have this conversation. And not ironically, as we do that, um, we take this vote in the shadow of another uh, uh, large scale shooting, not in this community, but in another. And uh, I come to a place where uh, I think uh, the practice of firearms and the utilization of firearms uh, inside the, the jurisdiction of and the city boundaries of New Orleans uh, is not something that, that I'm comfortable putting forward. And so that's why I'm making the motion to deny. Thanks. You're welcome. I, I would just like to also say that, you know, since we do make it a practice to um, state our reasons on the record, if we are going against staff's recommendation, because their reports are generally very thorough and I most often lean on what the staff recommends because they're so thorough and thoughtful. And um, I, this came to us through council motion. There's no pending project that is hanging in the balance because of this. I don't know that I would be voting differently, um, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a suggestion of how we go with the health, safety and welfare of the cities, of the citizens of New, New Orleans. Maybe this is, something we need to postpone um, uh, and, and think about where we are. And, and, and again, uh, and, and yet again, in the aftermath of the, uh, another tragedy, we consider something like this. I think it does give me pause as well. Thank you. All right. So um, I, I'll be supporting uh, the motion um, and, and just to add a little more context of uh, the reason why I'll be supporting the motion um, I think uh, in my first question that was raised is that um, I think when we open uh, particular new areas up, um, I think we should be more cautious, particularly in the city, because zoning is forever. Um, and then those changes could come through and there's no particular operator um, that is requesting this application. Uh, so there's no experience to actually, you know, have a thorough application and vetting process um, about how, how we move forward with this. Uh, so for that reason, I'll be supporting the motion. Um, any other commissioner? Does Commissioner Fleck also be in support of the motion? I, I just can in good conscience um, support permitted uses for um, firearms anywhere on the city of New Orleans. Yes, Commissioner Lunn, on record, same, same concern, same, no interest in promoting setting the groundwork uh, to invite shooting ranges in New Orleans. No, I wanna see less guns, not more. Thanks. All right, any other commissioner? All right, if there's no further discussion on the motion, I'll call the question, oh. uh, commission. I guess if we're putting our reasons on the record beforehand, before the vote, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna vote in favor of the motion, but not for the reasons articulated by most of the other commissioners really more for the reason articulated um i forgot by whom that we have no matter before us um i'm not in favor of a blanket prohibition of gun shooting ranges indoors in the city limits of new orleans i think it's uh something that could be done uh, perhaps uh safely and appropriately um but there's nothing in front of us so we really don't have the parameters of it and for that reason, I don't think there's any reason to rush to just throw a, 
uh, something together. So my reason to vote in favor of the motion is that there's nothing in front of us to, to, to give us the specifics uh, with which to consider it. So uh, it, it seems premature to me. So that's why I'm voting uh, in favor of the motion to deny. All right. Is there any further discussion on, on the motion? If there's no further discuss, discussion, I'll call the question. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Flick? Yes. Commissioner Lund? Yes. Commissioner Steig? Yes. Commissioner Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Wittry? Yes. Commissioner Weberg? Yes. All right. Uh, unanimous support for the denial of zoning docket uh, 1721. Uh, zoning docket 1921 and zoning docket 2021 were uh, removed from the agenda. Um, so now we'll continue on uh, to zoning docket 2521. And I believe we received uh, public comment. So commissioners, you can review that. Um, and Paul, I'll turn, turn it over to you. All right, the first comment is from Stephen Namasir, uh, 500 Pacific Avenue, in opposition, dear planning commissioners, please refer to the letter sent by the Algiers Point Association opposition to the request for an up zone at 300, 302, Libye, 603, 609 Pelican. Our position was taken after considerable input from neighborhood membership. This property has been in residential use for 100 years, therefore it is very different from the example of an existing corner store already serving the neighborhood given in the zoning description for an HUB1A property. Rezoning here would create a precedent for other one-time commercial properties, which similarly have long been in residential use to apply for zoning changes so that they could be used or sold as commercial properties. Such changes would undermine the CZO's support of the master plan and could fundamentally change the fabric of an HURD2 area. This seems especially problematic in a year where we are awaiting a master plan review. The crux of CCO's business plan as previously presented was to have five guest units available to the five owners, which is at odds with the current dedication of one of those units for a tenant manager whose presence and leasehold is necessary to qualify as a principal bed and breakfast. The APA very much wants to see our neighbors succeed, including those from CCO, but not at the expense of neighborhood as a whole. And the next comment is from Radu V. Gleese, 337 Alex Street in opposition. Spot zoning contravening the CCO and master plan amendment process is discriminatory and sets a bad precedent. As a multiple property owner in the neighborhood, please be advised that I will be requesting a similar change of zoning for every single property I own. Commercially zoned property is assessed and taxed at lower rates, despite being way more valuable on the actual real estate market. Such spot zoning was also predicated by me, uh, predicted by me and many others when the new short-term rental rules were recently adopted to favor commercial versus residential property owners. And I believe that's the last comment. Uh, commissioners, there there were a couple of comments that made it in before the form was closed, uh, but after I sent you that that document, so they're not in the document. I can read them into the record now. Yes. The first, okay. The first is from Sarah Keel at three twenty eight Olivier Street. She's in opposition to the application. She writes, "As a neighbor on the block, I'm strongly opposed to this and think it sets a terrible precedent." The next comment is from Robert Pell at 337 Morgan Street in opposition. He writes, I am opposed to this zoning change because when this building fails, the zoning change will remain forever. I'd support a conditional use. Uh, next comment is from Melanie Coons at 350 Avalon Court in opposition. The comment is the zoning change is inappropriate for a small, quiet residential block. The final comment is from Amisha Sharma at 433 Bermuda Street in opposition. Uh, and the comment is, I'm writing to express my opposition to the requested zoning change. Proposed uses of five unit short-term rental is inconsistent with the surrounding area, which is a quiet residential area. While the applicants assert that they are returning to pro the property to its original commercial use, Property has been residential for a lengthy period of time and the proposed use will be disruptive. 
Further, the proposed use of multi-unit short-term rental that is not owner-occupied will contribute to the shortage of affordable housing for New Orleans residents and cause harm to the fabric of the neighborhood. And that concludes the public comment. All right, thank you, Stephen. Um, at this time, can you remind, uh, can you state what the staff recommendation was for this docket? Sure, the staff recommendation was approval. All right, so at this time, commissioners, do you have a question for staff or a motion to put forward for this uh, zoning docket? I just had, a, I had a couple of questions. Um, one, there was discussion of a, some sort of a shop, an ancillary purposing. And so can staff walk me through that? Like, is that on the, on the spot zone, if we make this change, that is a legal and permitted use but is the ancillary structure, I, that, that, that part of it, I didn't quite understand. If staff could help me navigate that, that, that what, what was discussed and what's allowed, that would help me immensely. Yeah, so I, I can answer that. Um, the proposal, as I understand it, has two components. One is the principal bed and breakfast, which is a permitted use under the proposed HUB 1A zoning. The second component is a gift shop, which is a retail store, also a permitted use under the HUB 1A zoning. So those use those uses of the structure would be allowed by right. Um, the proposal to convert the rear garage to a it's uh, a dwelling unit would require a variance of the rear yard setback requirement. The reason for this is garages are allowed to be built in rear yards up against rear lot lines occupied residential structures or not. So to convert a garage to an occupied residential structure, there would need to be a variance of the setback requirement to allow that conversion to happen. That variance would go through the Board of Zoning Adjustments as a separate application. And then, and thank you for that, Stephen. And then the second piece I had a question on was a conditional use versus a spot zone. Um, walk me through that because that was one of the questions that was asked and, and, and again, just the nuance between the two. Yeah, so, so this district that's been requested is the lowest intensity commercial district that you could apply in this neighborhood, but it, it still does allow um, principal bed and breakfast as permitted uses. There's no way to modify the use permissions within this zoning district to say take bed and breakfast in particular and reclassify it from permitted to conditional. It, it, it is what it is in the zoning district. I think there was a suggestion that the zoning could be changed to some other district that happens to classify principal bed and breakfast as conditional, um, but that's not what the application is. Uh, you know, offhand the HURM1 I believe allows principal bed and breakfast as conditional. So. That's not what was evaluated because that's not what was requested. You know, generally our spot zoning policies are about residential to commercial zoning changes, which is what we have here, not about residential to residential zoning changes. So I don't know that that alternative zoning change had it been requested is something that we would have supported. That answers your question. Uh, and for what reasons wouldn't you have supported that on the HURM1 to conditional use? Yeah, so the spot zoning policy is really about taking buildings that are distinct from their residential surroundings and giving them a commercial zoning that is responsive to that. So the, the quintessential example is your corner store, angled entrance, you know, maybe a po' boy shop was there 50 years ago. It's a building that was constructed and designed for commercial use. But because zoning often happens in broad strokes, sometimes those historic commercial structures get a residential zoning. And so the policy is about returning the commercial zoning to match the commercial history of the structure, which is why the spot zoning policy is written to allow those residential to commercial rezonings. That logic applies here. Um, while this is architecturally more residential than you know we often see, um, it is a property that the applicant has demonstrated had a long history of non-residential use. And so the justification of the zoning change is to modify the zoning to reflect that historic non-residential use. 
Very thorough. Thank you, Stephen. All right. Are there any other comments or questions for, for staff or a motion um, by Commissioner? Commissioner Wittry has a question. So if we go ahead and um, if this is approved, can we clarify that there must be a property manager on site? Um, and or there's still question from the Board of Zoning Adjustments as they go for, further that um, the garage could be turned into a rental or to a property manager to live on site. Yeah, so if the zoning change is approved, it doesn't approve any one specific use. It doesn't grant any licenses. What, what it does is it opens the door for this to potentially be used as a, for example, a bed and breakfast. To do that, the bed and breakfast would need to be owner or operator occupied. And so it would have to, sounds like the plan here is for it to be operator occupied. So that would have to occur and be permitted and licensed appropriately through the Department of Safety and Permits. If the goal is also to convert that rear garage to any unit or, or operator occupied, guest occupied, anything else, there would have to be a separate discrete uh, application to the BZA to allow that to be converted to living space essentially. And then that would be rolled, should that be granted, it would be rolled into what ends up getting permitted and licensed through certain permits. Thank you, Stephen. Any other questions or a motion um, from a commissioner? Commissioners, I'll ask that if you're not speaking to kind of mute, uh, we're getting some noise in the background. Um, Commissioner Long, I move for a, a approval of the application as, as recommended by staff in their report. All right, it's been moved by Commissioner Long for approval. Um, as in staff, uh, as the staff report, is there a second to that motion? Commissioner Flick will second. All right, Commissioner Flick has seconded uh, the motion for approval. Um, is there any further discussion? Um, I would just like to um, say I, I appreciate my fellow commissioners. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna not vote for the motion on this one just for the reason that there's so many other that's a quiet little block um and while i appreciate the staff's assessment which the building is um lends itself to um this use um there are other uses that i think um are problematic for me and there are so many letters of opposition not only today but in the packet and the neighborhood had yet to really speak and I think they held out on 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 any um, formal approval and I am just not comfortable with this yet and the n number of owners um, it you know it could go either way which it, zoning is forever and that that concerns me All right. any other further discussion on the, on the motion any further discussion on the motion? If there's no further discussion on the motion, I'll call the question, Commissioner Brown. No. Commissioner Flick? Yes. Commissioner One? Yes. Commissioner Stieg? Yes. Commissioner Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Wittry? No, I'm also, I'm torn on this one. And so I echo Commissioner Brown's um, comments. All right, Commissioner Weber. Yeah, this is a this is really tough. Uh, I'm going to vote uh, uh, very hesitantly. I'm going to vote um, uh, for it, um, uh, and I very much understand where the neighborhood uh, is on it, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, understand uh, the concerns. Uh, but I'm going to vote for it. All right. Um, so um, that brings us to five two. So the motion um, is approved. 
Um, we'll continue on to subdivision docket 7420. So I don't see any public comments for that subdivision docket. All right, so we did not receive any public comment for a subdivision uh, docket 7420. Uh, Stephen, can you state what the recommendation for staff was? Sure, the staff recommendation is tentative approval subject to one waiver and three provisos. Okay, so at this time, commissioners, do you have a question for staff or a motion to put forward for subdivision docket 7420? Commissioner Wittry will move um, to approval staff recommendation um, with one waiver and three provisos. Commissioner Lund seconds. All right, it's been moved by Commissioner Wittry, seconded by Commissioner Lund for approval. Is there any further discussion on that motion? Any further discussion on the motion? There's no further discussion on the motion. I'll call the question. Uh, Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner Flick. Yes. Commissioner Lund? Yes. Commissioner Stieg? Yes. Commissioner Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Whitry? Yes. Commissioner Weber? Yes. All right. Unanimous support for the motion for approval. Um, and we'll continue to the last item on our agenda, which is um, agenda number um, eight. Um, I believe we have just a few public comments on this one. Yes. <clears throat> First comment is from D.S. Cooper, 638 Maroney Street in opposition. My name is Don Scott Cooper. I live at 638 Maroney Street. I urge the City Planning Commission to declare that the 621 Elysian Fields project is a major subdivision and set the project for a formal public hearing. Residents of the neighborhood deserve a fair and equitable process for providing feedback. It appears the current path is to circumvent that right. I would request that residents are be able to see a published environmental impact survey as well as an economic impact survey. The residents of the Maroney have been ravished by an extractive project after another, and I urge the CPC to do what's right for the residents of the Maroney and hold a more formal public hearing on this project. <clears throat> Next from Cap Black. In opposition, residents aren't game pieces swept aside and historic neighborhoods denatured to satisfy the narrow greed of gentrifiers trampling over lives while pursuing largesse. Next from Steve Marion, 1039 Montague, in, op in support. To be clear, I'm in support of reconsideration of the minor subdivision designation for the hotel project proposed for 621 Elysian Fields as it was clearly erroneous. This is a major project involving a large hotel complex and it seems obvious that the uh, inaccurate information was presented as part of the application which received the minor subdivision categorization. These are not separate hotel units and any presentation of the project as such is tendacious as best. This project is unquestionably a major subdivision and should be subjected at a minimum to greater scrutiny that designation would bring. It is not simply rejected at as it stands. Next from Andrew Jacoby, representing Foberg Marini Improvement Association in opposition. My name is Andrew Jacoby and I am an attorney representing FMIA. In his memo, the director cites two legal bases for reconsideration under the CPC rules at section B2. Both are incorrect. The director insists first that there is, quote, inaccurate data contained in the report, and second, that, quote, additional information warrants reconsideration. Regarding the first basis and the director's assertion that there is inaccurate data in the report, the director points to no report and no data, much less inaccurate data. In fact, there was no report, so there is no data. So this basis for reconsideration is wrong. In fact, restricting the 621 Elysian Fields project to my minor status would actually preclude a report from being completed. The director's second basis is that there is new information. Here too, the director does not state what the new information is. In fact, there is no new information. So both bases for a motion for reconsideration lack any substance and suggest instead that the motion should be rejected. The director's recommendations would block a full public hearing, would block city council review, and would block your own ability to review any aspect of the project. 
this would render commissioners powerless. The commissioners and the assistant city attorney said at the March 9th hearing, the CPC regulations are quote, clear that if the commissioner's own determination that there is reason or cause that is the best interest of the public for a public hearing, then the commission has the full discretion to call for one. The director even said that this would have, quote, absolutely no objection if the commission wants to hold a public hearing and that, quote, we would not object in any way at all. The director has now, was that two minutes? Yes. Okay. Move on to the next one. <clears throat> Beverly House, 3041 Royal Street in opposition. Opposition of Subdivision docket 11720 request for subdivision. This hotel project is clearly to subvert the CZO process and avoid adhering to the rules for hotels within the zoning. This project is being built next door to people's personal homes, not on the highway. The developer's avoidance of the neighborhood participation does not give faith that he's interested in how this project affects the established residential neighborhood. The whole compound will share property lines and street access with private residences. People who live there will deal with hotel guests parking on the street loud pool noise, trash, dumpster pickups, along with limiting their privacy. The project has an access road through the whole thing. It is not a tiny subdivision with two buildings with multiple uses. This request should be denied as it will open the door for other future hotel projects to use similar logic in, to develop properties for tourism profit at the expense of our tax paying neighbors and avoid the rules set in place by city of New Orleans for searching for loopholes. Next from Sandra Stokes, representing Louisiana Landmark Society in opposition. Louisiana Landmark Society was pleased to see the City Planning Commission vote on March 9, 2021 to send the five building hotel project at Elysian Fields and Royal Street to the City Council. The project as previously presented at various city meetings is a multi-building hotel complex with shared parking lot, driveway, garbage site, design, et cetera. The sudden request to resubdivide this project into five segmented parts took the neighborhood by surprise. This seemed a way to undermine the neighborhood participation program in order to allow a nearly 50,000 square foot hotel to proceed without going through the conditional use process. Splitting the project to under 10,000 square feet of segments does not allow for meaningful neighborhood input on the project and is certainly not in keeping with the spirit of the NPP. Luckily at the recent meeting to ratify resubdivisions, the commission saw the flaw voting to send it to the city council and a proper public process for a development of this size. Now the neighbors are, are stunned to find the executive director seems to want to continue to find an end run around the process. The commission is well within the purview of their duties to send this project to the city council. Simply put, a hotel over 10,000 square feet requires a conditional use permit and all rules that apply to a hotel over 10,000 square feet are applicable. We ask what is the drawback in simply allowing this to go through the conditional use process. This is an important prime site in the National Register Historic District. We thank you for your previous vote and ask you to stand by it, and allow this project to proceed to the city council. Next from Gary DeLomont, 2817 Burgundy Street, providing more information. <clears throat> Please uphold the denial of this minor subdivision. This should be allowed to go to the city council and allow for public input. Next from Jessica Fender, 1901 Burgundy in opposition. This needs to go to the full city council. It is appropriate for something this huge with this large of a potential impact on our neighborhood to be decided at this level. There are parking issues, trash issues, traffic issues, and character of neighborhood issues that need full vetting and opportunity for public comment. Next from Nora Natali, 1512 Pogger Street, in opposition. Pulled the denial of a minor subdivision and allow this to continue to channel with any real and allow this to continue to a channel with real public input to city council. Next from Brian Luck at 836 Gallia Street in opposition. Recently, commissioners chose not to ratify the proposed subdivision because a majority felt that a project this size deserves the public input afforded by the conditional use process. If you vote to ratify the subdivision today, neighbors will never have the opportunity to address the issue such a development would undoubtedly involve. There will be no NPP and no hearing at the city council. There'll be no design changes, no provisos and no regulations about deadlines for filing and construction. Commission hears public input on conditional uses all the time, but now the executive director is suggesting that the members do not have the competence to do what they normally do and that they should be silenced. You made the right decision the first time round. If the applicants are unhappy about it, they can make their case to the city council. Next from Joanna Bannon in opposition. 
I oppose the approval of 621 Elysian Fields to receive a minor subdivision variance for their hotel development. This hotel spans an entire city block, has single entrance, and shares amenities. Approval of this hotel development will create a cascade of problems for residents in the area, including traffic and parking issues. Please disapprove of this development. It does not fit with the scale of the architecture of the area and will fundamentally change the area from a residential area to a commercial one, which is not wanted by the residents of the neighborhood. Thank you. Next from Laura Guccione, 939 Montague Street. Uh, this is insane without any public input. Our neighborhood is being destroyed by developers. As a lifelong New Orleanian and resident of Bywater for over 20 years, I'm thinking about moving because of the trash, traffic, and noise. It's absurd how no one thinks about the people who actually live here year round and keep the city alive. Next from Jan Lemoir Harrigan, I'd like to provide information. <clears throat> this is five building, 47,000 square feet complex. It's definitely not five separate hotels. Come on, how stupid do you think we are? This developer needs to go through the conditional use process. Don't let this get swept under the rug. Please uphold your denial of the minor subdivision and allow this to continue to a channel with real public input. <clears throat> Carol Gagnotti in opposition, uh, 910 St. Rock Avenue. Please uphold the initial denial of the subdivision at 621 Elysian Fields and allow further review including providing public input. This hotel development project is not in keeping with the character of Mary. Thanks. Next, Julie Jones, representing Neighbors First for Bywater in opposition. The commission previously rejected the proposed subdivision of this property because the members recognized it would be an end run around the conditional use process. This process is necessary to build a hotel 37,000 square feet larger than is permitted. The executive director insists that the commission is not allowed to block this end run wherever you are permitted and you have already done it. Subdivisions would not require the commission's review if the intent of the law was to grant complete discretion to the executive director, it is not. The point of a city planning commission is to bring the zoning process out from behind closed doors, creating a transparent public interface. When the commission considered this issue originally, everyone had the right to weigh in, including the applicant, the staff and an executive director. Their choice not to attend the meeting today should not determine the outcome of the issue. Next from Asia Strong, 607 Elysian Fields <clears throat> in opposition. As a next door neighbor to this project, it will be on my property line. I would appreciate the project undergo proper protocols and submit to discussing with the neighbors. Next from Matt Del Vecchio, providing more information. It's not clear if I should support or opposition in this forum. My intent is clear in my comments. Dear planning commissioners, as Marini resident and neighbor, I. I'm in protest of the process in which the 47,000 square foot hotel development at 621 Elysian Fields is being pushed. Any hotel over 10,000 square feet in the Marini requires a developer to go through the conditional use process, accept public input and make the case that their hotel is needed in the neighborhood. This developer is trying to say these are actually five different hotels, even though they share a common entrance, exit, parking lot, swimming pool and garbage dumpsters. and will obviously be reassembled by use. <clears throat> this is not being honest to the spirit of the rules we have established to govern our community by. I do not agree with the way the executive director is pushing this development, and I don't see why it shouldn't go through the normal conditional use process, gathering community input and support, etc. Please uphold your denial of a minor subdivision and allow this to continue via a channel with real public input, the city council, so they can send this large development through the proper process we have always used to protect our interests as neighbors. Next from Maurice Scholas in opposition. This project is a 50,000 square foot hotel development that adds over 500 rooms to the neighborhood. The fact that this project was initially submitted as three separate projects using three separate addresses when it was an act of bad faith intended to skirt regulations requiring public feedback and comment. The project clearly represents a major subdivision via the creation of a private drive. It also adds a project that does not serve the needs of Marini. It will create greater parking and traffic congestion and it is squarely against the will of the community. This request for reinterpretation should be denied. Aside from my objection to the proposed use, it also represents an attempt to create a loophole in the existing approval process to allow large scale developments to escape the public scrutiny that should be required. This is bad for the Marini and sets a bad precedent for development in New Orleans. Thanks from Mark Lewis, 929 Toro Street in opposition. To your commissioners, as a homeowner in Marini, I am respectfully requesting that you uphold your denial of a minor subdivision for the proposed project at 621 Elysian Fields. 
The basis for my request, the city subdivision regulations state that any subdivision that creates a street is defined as a major subdivision and requires a vote on the CPC docket. Staff report public comments and final approval by the city council. Development should go through the conditional use process and accept public input. It's the right thing to do. Developers should never be allowed to come into our city and our neighborhoods and circumvent the approval process in an effort to silence our voices. Please uphold the denial of a minor subdivision for this property, uh, proposed property at 621 Elysian Fields. Next from Tom Harrigan, 2418 Royal Street in opposition. Please require one, a public hearing and two, full review of the proposed hotel development in my quiet little Marini neighborhood. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. <clears throat> Next from Mark Lewis, 929 Toro Street in opposition. Dear commissioners, as a homeowner of the Marini, I am respectfully requesting that you uphold your denial of a minor subdivision for the proposed property at 621 Elysian Fields. The basis of my request, the city subdivision regulations state that any subdivision that creates a street is defined as a major subdivision and requires a vote on the CPC docket, staff report, public comments, and final approval by the city council. Development should go through the conditional use process and accept public input. It's the right thing to do. Developers should never be allowed to come into our city and our neighborhoods and circumvent the approval process in an effort to silence our voices. Please uphold the denial of a minor subdivision for this proposed property at 621 Elysian Fields. Next from Ronald Prybolowski, 2026 North Rampart Street. I'd like to provide more information. CPC should either uphold their denial of a minor subdivision allowing real public input for this large development, my preferred outcome, or else be very specific about what allowed this project to be classified as a minor subdivision. For example, as a minor subdivision must not include a private or public roadway access, and each building must have a main entrance on an existing public street. Someone with more knowledge of city zoning code would be able to outline all the requirements of this site to meet the minor subdivision exception, so that a development on another site cannot just use this precedent of multiple buildings on a site to avoid public comment input or be treated as a minor subdivision. Next from Stephen Folks, 714 Spain Street in opposition. I request that the CPC uphold the denial of the minor subdivision application. The CPC should make sure this application is processed with full input from the public. As proposed, this application is actually a major subdivision and is a project that is exceedingly and dangerously large. And if approved, has the great potential for creating numerous serious del deleterious effects on the many neighboring and adjacent small scale residential properties. As proposed, this large development does not fit into the neighborhood. Sections of this unduly large parcel that fronts on Chargers and Royal Street should be limited to full time residential housing, not to exceed the normal density limits on any other residential properties in the neighborhood. Next from Thomas Douglas. 2218 Royal in opposition. I believe the executive director is exceeding his authority in ruling that this is a minor subdivision. The application has the distinct impression that this is being done to circumvent the opportunity for public comment in a meaningful manner. The proposed project is really a very large hotel, far too large a scale, that will negatively impact the immediate neighborhood with a development that is not needed. Please let us have an opportunity to comment. Thank you. Next from Jody Pareto, 300 Lake Marina Avenue in opposition. I ask the commissioners to uphold their denial of the minor subdivision and allow this to continue to a channel with real public input of this application. Next from Glade Bilby, 632 North Rampart, representing French Quarter citizens in opposition. French Quarter citizens in the surrounding neighborhood is very concerned with the process related to the subdivision and change of use of the property at 621 Allegiant Fields Avenue, formerly occupied by American Aquatic Gardens. It's our understanding that the property consisting of one lot was subdivided into five lots and the intended hotel project will encompass the entire property. There are a number of issues resulting from the process so far. Creating a minor subdivision is not open to public comment and is only voted on by the CPC. This ratification process does not allow for public comment at the CPC, nor allows it to go to city council bypassing public process for comment altogether. The entire way this property is being skirted through toward approval undermines the neighborhood and the people most affected by the development. Hotels are only allowed in HMC2 by conditional use. The developer intends to construct five hotels on this property, all just under 10,000 square foot threshold. This is yet another attempt to avoid public input or comment and effectively undermines the law itself. 
three by presenting this single project as five buildings at both the ARC and HDLC, they have stated that the two to three buildings are part of a single project. With a common parking lot, driveway, swimming pool, and garbage area, they are undermining their own efforts to skirt the law with this subdivision that will be operated as one project. Please uphold the denial of a minor subdivision and allow public input through the pro proper process, circumventing the rules that are in place further erodes the public confidence in the entities entrusted to protect the people of the surrounding neighborhoods. Next from Lisa Suarez in opposition. The director specifically state, said that the CBC staff has absolutely no objection if the commission wants to hold a public hearing and that the regs are clear on this and that he would not object in any way at all. Now the director says that the regs are no longer clear and now he is objecting after all. It is no longer the commissioner's purview in his opinion to allow for a neighborhood feedback on a project's impact in fact, the director frankly told you at the last hearing that the CPC did not consider any of the HDLC presentations. That is, the director is insisting on not getting information from HDLC presentations and public input that would lead to the obvious conclusion that this big development cannot and should not be artificially squeezed through the minor subdivision loophole. Rules at section 322 specifically say that all doubtful cases must be referred to the commission. When a project is cobbled together in pieces to pretend it is not a single project and to avoid public scrutiny and commissioner scrutiny, at the very least, a doubt is raised that warrants a hard look. Further, the director makes an incorrect argument that the meaning, spirit, and intent of the regs is that the commissioner's authority is limited to agreeing his, to his rules. In fact, the meaning, spirit, and intent is found right here in the words of the state and local laws establishing your authority. State law and local law mandate that the purpose of the CPC is to, in part, protect neighbors and ensure, quote, harmonious development with the surrounding neighborhood. See revised statutes 33, 107, 110, and 119, and subdivision regulations at sections K, 3, D, L, 2, and L, 2, B. Harmony with neighbors is the opposite purpose of what the director is arguing. Harmonious development with neighbors is actually being protected by public hearings and commissioner scrutiny. That is the spirit and intent of the law. It is not the rules intent to suppress neighbors' concerns. It is not the rules intent to ram massive developments through loopholes. 621 Elysian Fields was unmistakably designed to skirt the rules providing for a public hearing and avoid the commissioner's hard look. The Hi. Next from Dylan Zeller, 2718 Bell Street in opposition. I'm commenting on the proposed hotel development at 621 Elysian Fields. I'm requesting that the commissioners uphold your prior denial of minor subdivision and allow this process to continue to city council. It is important that items like this, which would have a disproportionately grand effect on the Marini, be subject to the proper channels with public input. This project is clearly a large hotel, which requires the developer to go through the conditional use process, which requires public input. CPC should be an advocate for this beautiful city and should work with the people of the city, not for big business. The fact that developer is attempting to, to claim that it is not on one large hotel is quite honestly offensive. The fact that BC Poor, Neighbors First for Bywater, French Quarter Citizens, and the French Faubourg Marini Improvement Association, Louisiana Landmarks and Preservation Resource Center have all come together under this cause is reason enough to look more closely at the issue. Next from Eugene Lamoff. 923 Maroney Street in opposition. I am a 30 year resident of the Maroney and do not support this hotel project. It seems clear that developers do not wish to be a part of the neighborhood, only profit from it. This project will set a new precedent that will further erode the quality of our community. Next from, next from Leslie Nonkin, 2227 Royal in opposition. I live at 2227 Royal Street, which is directly across the street from the new exit driveway of the proposed Elysian Fields Hotel Complex. The project rounds counter to the purpose of the subdivision regulations, which is to encourage the orderly and beneficial development of the community through appropriate growth management techniques, which assure that adequate public facilities accompany new development. <clears throat> this project contributes neither adequate public facilities nor any amenities to the benefit of the neighborhood. By considering this project a minor subdivision and thereby avo avoiding a public hearing process, the CPC has precluded any opportunity for public discussion on the impact of the subdivision and it's related five hotel complex. This includes the effect of traffic emptying on a Royal Street, a one-way street in a residential location, and also the impact of the substantial increased demand for on-street parking in a neighborhood where parking is already at a premium. 
based upon the zoning ordinance's rule of thumb of one required parking space for each two bedrooms. This project will require at least 50 new, 50 additional parking spaces. <clears throat> With all due respect, we ask the CPC if they consider it appropriate that a major construction project comprised of five hotels settling 45,000 square feet with over 110 bedrooms should be allowed to proceed without any forum whatsoever for public comment or even an NPP or other opportunity for neighborhood input. But this is precisely what the CPC is doing in approving this five building project to be a minor subdivision. If the CPC isn't going to rep represent the interests of the neighborhood most affected by this development, then the city council should look at it. Next from Nathan Lott, 923 Chapatulas, representing Preservation Resource Center in opposition. Good afternoon, commissioners. When subdivision docket 11720 came before you previously, you headed concerns that in this particular case, subdivision was requested solely to avoid triggering a public hearing and neighborhood participation process. Thank you. It is unfortunate that deferral wasn't an option, as I am sensitive to the fact that every applicant should have the opportunity to state their case. However, this subdivision request is now on the path to a city council hearing. That council meeting will provide a public forum at which the applicant, neighbors, and other stakeholders can address the matter. Therefore, reconsideration is not needed to achieve our mutual goals of transparency and community involvement in land use decisions. Thank you. Next, Donna Wakeman in opposition. Unlike his comments at the March 9th hearing, the director now insists the commissioner's section 313 power to call for a public hearing is, quote, overbroad and warns you uh, that your authority is, quote, ripe for abuse, but he admits that your recent vote is the only time this has ever happened. There is no abuse here. Let's be clear, the rules establish that you are an independent expert authority with the ability to ensure that neighbors' interests are not swept aside in the effort to get changes made. The authority applies to, quote, any subdivision, not just major subdivisions. The commissioners are right that a project of this scale and scope changing the very nature of the aquatic gardens to a big hotel deserves neighborhood input for the commissioners to rule against their own power will be a dangerous precedent. The director has also provided a fallback argument that carries no legal weight whatsoever. Specifically, the director has presented the commissioners with a false dichotomy. He says that you must either one, ratify the subdivision, or two, that if you do mandate a public hearing based on 313's best interest of the public, that you must block the neighbors from speaking broadly about the project's impact on their interests. He says that you must limit the scope only to whether the proposed subdivision meets the three to criteria, and that also you must defer to the director's determinations, but the law clearly and expressly empowers you far beyond what he says. Your power is not perfunctory authority, nor one of deference. You are not bound by, to endorse anything that the director places in front of you. Instead, the commission should vote to reiterate that the 621 Legion Field project's scale and scope warrant a denial in order to allow for a public hearing by the city council. Next from Kip Rhodes, 2515 Dauphine Street in opposition. <clears throat> it appears the commission and the developer are trying to circumvent the public's opportunity to comment on this major and massive development. I'm not sure that anyone is saying that this should not be developed in this way, but I think most people would agree that the public has a right to comment on what happens in their neighborhood. Next from Kenneth Holler, Jr., 931 Elysian Fields in opposition. As resident and homeowner two blocks away on Elysian Fields, this hotel complex is neither warranted nor welcomed. The developer has misrepresented the project and the executive director of CPC has hastily approved the project under false pretenses. What was originally pitched as a subdivision of two buildings has turned into five, all connected by a single private road and all sharing singular common amenities and services. They are attempting to circumvent the process and take advantage of loopholes. The language is clear, Project should be denied and sent to city council for review and subject to public comment. Next from Aaron Holmes, 816 North Rampart, representing VC Pora in opposition. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you for your opportunity to weigh in again on this agenda item. We join concerned Marini residents in asking that you uphold your previous denial of the major subdivision, minor subdivision, and allow it to proceed to city council. This avenue seems to be the best approach for appropriate public input on the project as a whole. Subdivision process clearly reads as an attempt to avoid the conditional use process and is required public input. The use is singular despite how many pieces it can be divided into. This is a 45,000 square foot, five building hotel that was designed with shared amenities across multiple lots, particularly a private thoroughfare or street connecting each would be parcel. This is a large commercial development that very much has the potential to affect its adjacent neighbors. It should be considered a major subdivision and continue through the prescribed conditional use process. 
In the memo from Director Rivers, he underscores the meaning, spirit, and intent of the subdivision regulations. What about the meaning, spirit, and intent of the neighborhood participation program, which was designed to encourage early citizen participation in the development review process, open a dialogue between the applicant and affected neighborhoods, neighborhoods, neighborhoods and individuals, and improve communications between the development community, citizens, and city government. Allowing this process to proceed unchecked will set a damaging precedent for neighborhoods citywide and will undermine public faith in land use decision making. Thank you for your careful consideration of this matter. Uh, I have another comment from Matt Del Vecchia, but I believe we read that already. Next from Karen Jeffries, 1830 Dauphin Street in opposition on March 9th. Commissioners decided that it was in the best interest of the public to have a public hearing and decided to send this to the city council where everyone, not just the applicant and Mr. Rivers, would be able to give meaningful com comment. Currently, the applicant and Mr. Rivers are free to give testimony and a 10 and a half page memo. Citizens are limited to written comments as long as they don't go longer than two minutes. This hardly seems fair. The applicant wanted to be heard. He could have attended the last meeting like the neighbors did. Please reject this and this do over and let us have our day at city council. Next from Michelle White, 1918 Burgundy, providing more information. As a Marini resident and property owner, I'm expressing my extreme concern about the out of scale hotel planned for 621 Elysian Fields. Marini does not need another hotel or the influx of such a larger number of additional tourists in the neighborhood that is already struggling with infrastructural and quality of life issues. The project needs to get through the conditional use process and have full review by neighborhood organizations and citizens. Commissioner's denial of the minor subdivision proposal should be supported so that there can be a full process of review and public input. Next from Jeffrey Seymour, 2225 Royal Street. In opposition, we are perplexed that the CPC did not consider the 621 Elysian Fields Avenue project a major subdivision by virtue of the fact that a new street and traffic pattern were proposed. The driveways clearly meet the definition of street in the subdivision regulations. They are undisputably public or private thoroughfares and one-way entrance on Elysian Fields Avenue clearly provides access to the parking spaces on the abutting properties of buildings A, D, and E. The executive director's suggestion that this would make a sidewalk a street is an absurd proposition. Obviously, vehicles don't drive on sidewalks. How could the CPC say that the project is not creating a new street and therefore this is a minor subdivision? Perhaps the answer lies uh, in fact, that the final plan submitted and administratively approved by the executive director did not show any of the proposed five proposed buildings, or more importantly, did not show any of the newly created streets and driveways servicing the new parking lots. We don't understand why this information was omitted in the final plan, which was recorded on 12 20 especially in light of the regulations requirement that all, at, uh, that all final plans, whether they are for a major or minor subdivision, must include the boundary lines of the subdivision, streets, easements, and other rights of way in addition to the proposed location of and width of streets, alleys, and servitudes. Based on what was recorded, it looks like the CPC staff reviewed was a basic single page survey showing that the new subdivided, subdivided property lines. And speaking of the process of recording a final plan, how can a final plan be recorded before it's been ratified? How is it that the subdivided property was actually sold before the final plan was recorded? Both of these actions are specifically prohibited by the subdivision regulations. Mr. Rivers' memorandum references inaccurate data and new information, but never mentions what any of these are. Why would the CPC's decision on the subdivision now be any different than it was two weeks ago when they denied it? What was the inaccurate data that the CPC depended upon in rendering their March 9th decision? Mr. Rivers rever references a report, but there is no report. And why is it the CPC rather than the applicant who is re uh, requesting this reconsideration? If the developer disagrees with the CPC's March 9 decision, he has the right to appeal to the city council. If the commission today rescinds its denial and chooses instead to ratify the subdivision, we would like an explanation from the commissioners on how this is an example of the CPC operating in the best interest of the city's citizens rather than the CPC, for some reason, favoring a highly suspect subdivision request on the part of an out-of-towner, out-of-town developer. Next from Cindy Hogan, 2331 North Rampart in opposition. We need a more creative use for the empty space than a hotel. The area is already flooded with Airbnbs. Next, Susan Ingram, 1919 Dauphine in opposition. The subdivision regulation state, it shall be the duty of the city planning commission to rule on the meaning, spirit and intent of the provision of these regulations 
is necessary for the administration thereof. The spirit of these regulations is to divide the property. That is not happening here, where the developer is pretending to divide them in order to avoid conditional use requirements for hotels in Marin. Please reject this minor subdivision and send it to the city council. Next from Lonnie Benura, 933 Elysian Fields in opposition. As a resident and homeowner two blocks away on Elysian Fields, this hotel complex is neither warranted nor welcomed. The developer has misrepresented the project and the executive director of CPC has hastily approved the project under false pretenses. What was originally pitched as a subdivision of two buildings has turned into five, all connected by a single private road and all sharing singular common amenities and services. They are attempting to circumvent the process and take advantage of the loopholes. The language is clear, the project should be denied and sent to city council for review and subject to public comment. <clears throat> Next from Eve Abrams, 1028 Montague, in support of the application. It seems like there is some clever maneuvering going on here to circumvent public input regarding a large hotel development. Please, commissioners, uphold your denial of a minor subdivision and allow this project to continue to proceed with real public input. The City Council, please ensure that this development goes through the proper process. Next from Lisa Walters, 929 Legion Fields Avenue, in opposition. I'm asking you, the commissioners, to uphold their denial of a minor subdivision and allow this to continue to channel with real public input the city council so that they may they can deny it and send this large development through the proper process. There is nothing about this plan that makes sense for Elysian Fields as, and as a homeowner that is two blocks away, the city council as well as the residents need to have a say in what is going on in their neighborhood instead of having something that is not needed or wanted shoved down their throats because of someone else's agenda. At this moment, <clears throat> city drains have stopped draining and our street is flooding. So it doesn't seem like the time to add a large multi-structure ho hotel when the neighborhood's infrastructure can't even handle the rain. Next from Felipe Fisher, 925 Toro in opposition. Neighbors on March 9th brought their concerns to the city planning commission. The developer chose not to attend and is now asking for reconsideration. This is an insult to the people who did show up. You say you did, you took our uh, input seriously, but you have no problem dismissing the hard work we did in learning the rules and preparing for the last meeting. And now we might not have an avenue for appeal. Please let this continue to the city council for true public input. <clears throat> Next from Alexandra Maine, in support. As a local business owner and resident of Marini, I'm writing to support FMI's position that this project be reconsidered as a major subdivision in order to most effectively open the discussion with the public. Any project of this size and density should be exposed to the rigor of public comment, particularly one that is yet another hotel and a hotel laden town. At a minimum, the complexity of this application urgently warrants reconsideration. More broadly, the various means and methods approvals that affect so many proximate interests should not be the burden of a single singular decision maker, the CPC director, the ratification agenda outlining the subdivision process should be immediately amended, not only to protect the interests of our citizenry, but to protect the developer and civic leaders alike. Processes that have not been updated for 20 years might very well be part of the problem. A massive hurricane, technological revolution, and urban growth have all drastically changed the approval landscape since then. As a neighborhood stakeholder who is also pro-development, my position is not one of antagonizing obstructionists. Equally, and as such, it is in the developer's interest to garner the public's input lest one more time. Drama, uh, lest one more time drama and an ever shifting economic landscape further undermine the viability of the project. Next from Fontaine Allison Wells, 1019 Montague in opposition. Any hotel over 10,000 square feet in the Marini requires the developer to go through the conditional use process, accept public input, and make the case that their hotel is needed in the neighborhood. The developer is trying to say these are actually five different hotels, even though they share a common entrance, exit, parking lot, swimming pool, and garbage dumpsters, and will be reassembled by use. This is ridiculous, and as they constantly promoted the site as one project and even presented the buildings to the Architectural Review and Historic District Landmarks com Committees, as to not five different groups of buildings. Anyone who merely glances at this proposed project would immediately say that it fits the need to, for the conditional use process. They are proposing 47,000 square feet, trying to skirt the process by claiming 
five, 10,000 square feet or less buildings to avoid the process is just not okay. It's not okay. Please deny the project as a major minor subdivision and send it through a more thorough process that involves the input of the entire CPC and the public. Next from Dion Lane, 2113 North Rampart in support. Please review the hotel being built on Elysian Fields in the Marini. We do not need or want any more hotels in our area. There are already two and a third under construction. Please make this affordable housing for people that want to live and work in our city. Please make sure the contractor and plan is forced to go through a full review before another neighborhood is destroyed by greed. Thank you. Next from Alan Johnson, 1418 Charter Street, representing Foberg Marin. Mr. Rivers laid out the criteria from minor subdivision except for two points. One, that a minor subdivision not include the creation of a street and two, all doubtful cases must be referred to the commission. Time limitations make it difficult for me to point out all the errors in his critique of this issue, but he equates sidewalks and street, which is absurd. Mr. Rivers defended his decision by stating that he had only seen the survey that didn't have a site plan, which included the new street from Elysian Field, from Elysian to Royal that crossed four properties. But what hasn't been addressed is the requirement that all doubtful cases must be referred to the commission. The street and size of this property should have at least raised some curiosity as it, and it were, should have been brought to you the way, way before this point. We understand how difficult this is, has been to work during these weird times and with budget cuts at City Hall, but that doesn't mean that mistakes this big shouldn't be corrected. CPC should see that these mistakes are corrected for the neighbors. Mr. Rivers mentioned the developers do process, but who is going to look out for us? The neighbors did their job and brought their voices to you at the proper venue. We shouldn't be punished with this short-term rental compound because of these mistakes. Please send this to the city council at the very least start the process over. Next from Heidi, Kelma, providing more information. <clears throat> Subdivision process docket 11720. It should be clear that the lack of requirements for the commissioner's approval of Meyer subdivisions gives the commissioner great discretion. The administrator's hands are tied, but not the commission. There is nothing requiring the commissioners to approve the subdivision. It is obvious that the developer is using the subdivision to circumvent certain zoning requirements. They made a good call, potentially saving us a long drawn out fight, and it should stand. Sometimes we need to let common sense prevail. At the very least, it must go to public process. That said, it sounds as if the time issue could be problematic. There's a lot at stake here. It would be good to have a court ruling before proceeding. And by keeping the denial in place, it may provoke the developer to request one. Also agree with the assessment that rule and policy changes need to be made to prevent this from happening again, including not making subdivisions official until the commission approves them. Next from Nikki Swolinski. 10, 11, St. Philip in opposition. I support the CPC's initial decision and ask the commissioners to uphold it. On initial review, I noted the application seems incomplete in that the survey lacks the criteria required as far as site details. The idea that this large project with a single entrance is not one develop development is laughable. The CZO is not doing its job and leveling the playing field between residents and developers. Instead, it has become an arcade game where developers and flippers hire architects and attorneys to work applications to the city channels by, in by pushing every boundary and rule. This project is no exception. This project will overwhelm the neighborhood and bring a large hotel complex where it is neither needed or wanted. I also note that Article 1.4D, all subdivisions shall comply with the City of New Orleans subdivision regulations. Where conflicts occur with this ordinance as determined by the executive director of the city planning commission, the more restrictive regulations shall prevail. Please uphold your decision and send this to the city council for public comment. <clears throat> uh, next from Jeffrey Seymour, 2227 Royal Street. The repeat uh, comment. Thank you. And then in that case, Barbara Lafleur. Lafleur. Last comment, 2218 Royal Street. I believe that this property falls under the major subdivision rules as it includes the creation of a street called a driveway in application that passes through the development from Legion Fields to Royal Street. Therefore, this application requires a public hearing. All right, Stephen, um, did we receive any more uh, comments that were not included in the public comment packet? No, the, that was all the comments. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Paul, for, uh, for reading all those public comments into the record. Um, 
at this time, I'm going to allow uh, time for the applicant uh, to respond uh, and, and rebuttal. Um, but I just want to ask uh, to staff um, one one particular question before uh, he bring those he he responds. Um, the difference between a minor and a major subdivision, I understand those different differences in principal steps, but um, was it just based on that a major subdivision is not in the scale uh, of the size of what is to come? That's why it was still considered a minor subdivision. I just want kind of clarity around that. You're on mute, Bob. Yep. Let me, um, sure. So um, the subdivision regulations distinguish between major and minor subdivisions based on the number of lots that are produced and whether or not there is a street. So a subdivision that is proposed for five or fewer lots that does not create a street is a minor subdivision by definition. And then once that determination is made, you look at the different review and approval policies in Article 3 um, to determine which path, which review path, an approval path, a application is reviewed under and approved under. In this case, because the application and the proposed subdivision complied with all of the applicable regulations in the subdivision regulations and all the applicable regulations in the zoning ordinance, not the use-based ones, but the lot size, shape, um, area, so on and so forth, um, that, that are applicable to the configuration of the lots, which is what the, zoning, the subdivision review process is about, that um, it would fall into policy B as a application that was eligible for administrative approval. At this time now, I'm yeah, going to can I uh, follow up on that before we hear from the developer, sure, to, uh, Commissioner Stewart? Just to um, so, Bob, uh, we've heard from uh, some of the public testimony about that that there's going to be a private street created, um, and uh, so can you comment on the, it's five or fewer, and it doesn't create a street. So can you explain why this development as presented to you does or doesn't create a street? Because that's an additional criteria for minor subdivision. Sure. Um, I think the, the, what has been proposed is a shared driveway access. Um, it, it does run through um, multiple lots. Um, I think the, the thing that I pointed to in my, um, in my uh, memo to you all is that the definition in the subdivision regulation speaks to a thoroughfare that provides access to abutting properties. Um, this is something that is um, a driveway on, um, on, um, excuse me, on the um, properties it, that are being subdivided. Um, so it is not a dedicated street, either public or private. It's not a dedicated thoroughfare. Um, it is um, a driveway that is added um, as part of the development plan. And does the, does the street, it, but it connects two public streets. It runs all the way through from Legion Fields to Royal or um, it, it isn't a dead end with a cul-de-sac it, and turns around, it connects, it's a, it runs all the way through and connects My two streets? Yes, it's a one-way um, one entrance in and one-way entrance out on a different street. Okay. Which is okay. a, which, which is a, you know, it's a common site design um, element. You see it in shopping centers, you see it in 
Um, you see it in circular driveways um, that you um, that it that create that is you know that are similar. Um, and I and I don't um, I don't read the regulations as as um, defining this as a street. Okay. Good. Thanks. All right. Just so, one. So it's, just is it considered a private drive? Is not a street? Because even if it were ending in a cul-de-sac, there are plenty of public road streets that are cul-de-sacs. And, and those those would be classified as public as private streets, not private drives. So okay, it, but in this in this application, is this a is this this is a privately owned drive that can be closed off? Is that correct? So that's not why it's considered a street. Um, it is not dedicated as a thoroughfare for public or private use. It is. It is. It is a driveway, just like any other driveway. Um, so that is what took it out of the major subdivision classification because it's not considered a street. So the driveway, it, it wasn't presented in the subdivision application as a street. In other words, there was no, um, you know, when you, when you have a subdivision that creates a street, you have a dedicated parcel of land that is set aside for a street, whether it's going to be dedicated to the public, uh, to the city as a public street, or whether it's going to be reserved um, for private use as a private street. It, it's, it's dedicated as a separate parcel of land that provides access to those parcels of lands that abut it. Um, and that, that's, that's the common definition, common consideration of what a street is versus a driveway, which is the access that is, um, that is created from the street onto the property itself. Um, so, so that's the distinction. Okay, and, and Bob, just one follow-up question on that. So I guess street versus driveway, that determination was made by you, but not necessarily uh, safety and permits, or does safety and permits have the final say on what- So that basically our review is based on what is presented on the survey that is submitted. And the survey requirements um, are um, that, you know, it, it's a land survey um, that shows the lots. So if there's no existing street or no existing driveway, it's not going to be shown on the, on the survey. Um, there's no dedication of any property on the survey. All there was was creation of five lots, um, which according to the subdivision regulations was an approvable subdivision. Absolutely. Can I thought, follow up on the street issue? Um, mm -hmm. Am I wrong that if a drive, if, if these lots were separated into five and then the developer were to lay down a concrete strip for a private drive, but it crossed property boundaries, that that, that would be construction of an improvement that crossed uh, boundaries between lots, even though they might be owned by the same person and that that would require, what would that require from safety and permits? Sure. You can't build sure. a building across property lines we all know that sure. so what would safety and wouldn't safety and permits require a servitude or something uh between the 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 lots to um to place a roadway partially on one, or a driveway partially on one lot and partially on another so i think if there's a difference in ownership and i can't speak to that um there would need to be a servitude that defined the rights of all the different parties to use that particular drive access. Um, let me say this. I think that the design, the shape, the width, the, um, the uh, landscaping, the buffering, all of that is a site design requirement that lives in the zoning ordinance. 
and not in the subdivision regulations. So that the Department of Safety and Permits, when they review the building permit application and the site plan that it goes along with that, they will be reviewing that um, in accordance with the requirements of the zoning ordinance. And this, let me let me just step back and and kind of. Um, I think there's a there's a lot of comments that suggest that it's my determination whether or not this goes for a conditional use or not. That's that's not the case. That's a determination made by the Department of Safety and Permits. Um, that is the um, authority identified in the uh, zoning ordinance as being able to interpret and make zoning determinations uh, and interpret the zoning ordinance. So those determinations are made as part of the, the uh, as part of the Department of Safety and Permits review of an application. They look to see whether it's compliant with the zoning. They make a determination whether it is compliant with the zoning. And that determination is, um, is challengeable um, by the public to the Board of Zoning Adjustments if there's, if, if there's concern with what that determination is. Um, if the applicant, um, if the application is determined not to comply with the zoning ordinance, um, but for the existence of a conditional use, then the Department of Safety and Permits will require that the project go before um, the conditional use process. It's not something that I have authority to make that determination. All I'm doing is, and all we are doing as a city planning commission staff is administering the subdivision regulations um, that pertain to this, this application. Bob, John, you're on mute. Question. Um, um, Commissioner Stewart, could I go ahead with a quick question? A follow-up thing. Um, so, so Commissioner Lyon, um, yeah. let's give uh, the, the applicant okay. a chance to respond. Um, I'm more than sure that we'll have plenty of time for dialogue um, after um, hearing his rebuttal um, to this. And then at that time, it'd be more appropriate to kind of ask staff um, questions. So let's hear from the, um, the applicant at this time. Okay. Um, and uh, Mr. Connick, you have three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> there seems to be a lot of comment about a hotel that was presented to the HDLC beginning of last year, or you know, the, the plan, the development plan that was in place at the beginning of last year before the pandemic. Um, now that plan is no longer the development plan. Um, so just to put that out there to you guys and the owner, I mean, I've talked to the ownership during this conversation when the comments are rolling in, that is no longer the development plan that, that is in place currently. Um, but, you know, there currently isn't really a development plan, but when there will be a development plan that will go through the process of the zoning analysis. Um, as correctly noted by Director Rivers, this is not the proper venue to discuss zoning um, and the eventual use of the property. We're here to talk about a subdivision and whether or not the subdivision complies with the, um, the City Planning Commission's uh, subdivision regulations. Um, specifically, I'm gonna pull some snippets out from, from, from the memo that was presented. Uh, there is nothing in the subdivision regulations that provide for uh, the administrative review to be, rev to be reviewed under a related zoning matter. Um, again, there's a different process that's established for that. Safety and permit zoning um, will be looking at this and, and all of the neighbors that have issues with, um, with any use that comes down the pipeline later on has a forum and um, to discuss it then, and, and there's conditional uses it there as well as other things um, down the line that will present that opportunity to them. Again, that's not, it's, out that, it's outside the scope of what we're talking about here in connection with a resubdivision. Um, and, and I would just say another thing that, that, that I believe is, is um, really, really a good point that, that from the memo is that these two processes are not interchangeable. They are separate and there's a reason why they're separate. Again, we're looking at this from one, from one perspective, we're not looking at this um, as a global project where zoning implications are gonna be considered because we have a, set, we have a separate process for that. Um, so that, that's, my, that's our rebuttal to it. But you know, as, as far as um, concerns about you know, the hotel that we're all around, again, that's not the development plan um, at this point. 
and uh, any, few, any any development plan down the road will be will go down the you know CZO zoning regulation guidelines um, and comply with those guidelines as we've complied with the zoning regulation guidelines. Um, so thank you all very much. So I, uh, I have a question of the developer, if that's okay. Wait. So no, tell me, Jonathan, is that okay or no? Yeah, go ahead. Um, we, we have heard about a roadway though. And so you're wanting to divide five lots and, you know, so are, what, are, what are the basic plans for a roadway? If I can just make one correction there, it's not, I don't believe it's defined as a roadway. I don't think that the city planning staff is defined as a roadway, it's a driveway. Good, it tell me about the driveway. Well, it meets all the, all the requirements of a driveway. Um, and again, that's also outlined in um, Director Rivers' uh, memo is that it is not, it, it's a driveway per, per the definition of a driveway under- so, But what I'm asking you is to describe it to us. Where is it going? How wide is it gonna be? Where is it gonna go? Well, let me pull up the, the survey. Um, but I believe it, what it allows for is off-street parking for, for the lots that are gonna be created, um, which is not uncommon. Um, I'm currently working on a subdivision on Magazine Street that has limited parking on the street and we have um, access from the rear coming off of a different street. So you have a property that fronts on two streets and what we're doing there is just getting cars off the street and allowing access to the back and there's two parking spaces in the rear. Um, right. Something we think would be welcome, yeah. So, so tell me, but go ahead and tell, still that I wanna hear an answer to the question which is, uh, where, where does it enter, where does it go, and where does it exit? You can give me a minute, I can pull up the survey. Or if we have it in our, in our graphics, it might be more, um, we can pull that graphic back up if y'all can do that, it might be uh, helpful for everyone to see. Um, so on this survey, let me see. And this is the final resub survey. I don't see the, let me see if I can zoom in on it, if I can see the road, if there is the driveway on here. Okay, this is, um, this is why you don't see it on this survey. The comments that you're seeing that are made about the driveway were done on that HGLC proposal that was submitted previously when the discussion was to have a hotel. There is currently no driveway. That, those comments are about hypothetical plans that were submitted. So as you can see on the survey right here, the reason why I can't see it is because it doesn't account for a driveway or roadway or anything. Um, so sorry for that mischaracterization, but I think that when that, the memo was talking about the hypothetical plan that was submitted back before the pandemic, which, is, which has since changed. And it's not a part of the, uh, the resubdivision application in any way. So that shouldn't be a concern. Um, but in terms of the, of the developer's intentions, are, are you saying on the record that the developer is not gonna put a driveway that, can, that runs through the prop, this, these five lots? Oh, what I'm telling you is that what's in front of you is, is the proposed resubdivision. And if he does decide to put a driveway behind it, it will comply with all zoning regulations and guidelines as, as, as does this resub. Okay, Mr. Mr. Town, I have a follow-up question. So from when you initially submitted this uh, application, there was a driveway when you initially submitted it? And that changed? I think that's incorrect. I think that that was on, no, that there was never a driveway on this application per the survey that was submitted. That driveway, and I think the comments are coming from uh, what was, in order to talk to HGLC about the previous development plan, they had to, I think they have a site plan or, or a proposed site plan for, um, with buildings on it and, and et cetera. And I believe that the driveway conversation is coming from that unofficial, basically, you know, previous development idea, but no, the resub surveys that you see on the screen right now has not changed. Absent, we had a we had a real estate and record clarification to about the title actual dimensions on some of the lots, and that was the only update to this survey since it has been um, uh, submitted. So again, that was the miscommunication: is that there is no driveway um, as part of this application. 
And as of today, there's no plans for um, for for the lots. It's just a subdivision that, that you're requesting. There's That's no correct. Plan. There's so so um, at this time, the owners or the development team doesn't have anything to present to the community or the residents that are but the property or around the property of any plans for plans for the future. That's correct, and you know, I guess what I would say to clarify it is. Um, when that does come together, you know, there's a there's the CZO and the zoning process to go through. And in the event that that's a conditional use, or in the event that it's uh, if it's not a conditional use, I mean that there's um, there's the guidelines and the MPP programs in place to to to, to have the, the community input on on the use of it. But yes, that's correct. As of right now, it's, it's we're talking about the resale division of land. Okay, um, I think I believe um, earlier I asked you if you would be opposed to like a deferral on this? It seems like you've been in contact with um, the, the team or the owners, the ownership um, of, of these parcels. Um, is that something that you inquired, you asked them directly and they were still opposed to it? Since there is no site plans, there is no future development as of right now? Well, let me just preface it with this response. This property was sold and, and, and the, the resale division was, was, the final approval was done basically four months ago now. Um, this uncertainty that we believe is shouldn't really exist um, is not something that we want to carry forward any further. Um, it's been 141 days since the official submission date, 82 days since the notification letter, 77 days since the application, since the subdivision was recorded. Um, so no, I, I don't think we, we are interested, you know, we would like for there to be, you know, a decision um, considering the amount of time that has passed and, and where we are to where we still are with this process. So, so your answer is no? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, the, yes, the answer is no. Okay. All right. So at this time, commissioners, do you have any questions for uh, staff or um, the applicant representative that's present? I have a question for staff. Um, given that the plans as presented in the um, original application for a subdivision are apparently no longer valid, and given that um, the administrative approval under policy A, B, or E of Article 3 requires um, written statements of no objections to the proposal um, by the reviewing agencies, are we now in limbo where since there is no firm proposal um, that um, that notification level le letter rather is um, null? Um, I don't know um, which agencies are required to sign off to trigger what shall be approved. And so I'm asking both who would have to sign off and what scale of proposal they would need to have seen um, in order to sign off with no objection. Sure, again, um, understanding that this is a subdivision review process and not a zoning process, the development plan that is, as I understand it from Mr. Connick, that is no longer on the table was never a part of this application. That the, the only substance to this application is what you see on the screen, which is the subdividing of one lot into five lots. So the development plan that was presented to the HDLC, that was um, presented to the uh, Department of Safety and Permits earlier, um, from what Mr. Connick is saying, that proposal is no longer the plan but that does not affect the substance of the subdivision review of the subdivision plan submission, which is to divide it into five lots. So to your question about would the agencies that it needs to be referred to need to revisit anything? No, because they're looking at the configuration of the lot. Um, and so the, the and, and, and what that would present in terms of, um, you know, from a uh, real estate and records perspective, um, whether or not the lots are um, consistent with um, 
with the uh, and and the dimensions and the and the the boundaries uh, descriptions whether those are consistent with the public record and and what is is currently recorded in the public record um, with respect to DPW whether or not there are adequate um, whether or not there are any kind of sidewalk um, or um, right of way issues that need to be addressed. Um, with respect to utilities, Entergy, Sewage and Water Board, um, are these lots served by adequate public facilities in terms of water and electrical connections? Um, those are the types of things, those are the types of agencies that are, um, that are subject to the referral. Um, and, and again, all of those things um, are based upon the configuration of the lots as presented and not what is proposed for a ultimate use of the property. Um, those agencies, again, will have the opportunity to weigh in during the building permit process um, to evaluate the development proposal um, and, and then make comments as part of the building review process, the building permit process. Does that help? Thank you. And, and Bob, at, at what point does the public have the opportunity to provide input on the development? On the, on the use of the property? Sure. So it depends on what is submitted. Um, if they are submitting um, something that is by right, that it's a permitted right, um, that's a determination that is going to be made by the Department of Safety and Permits. Um, if the uh, if the neighbors um, disagree with that determination, that determination can be challenged through a zoning appeal to the Board of Zoning Adjustments, uh, which would hear that appeal in a public forum. Um, and um, that decision is um, ultimately appealable to the courts. If the if what is submitted is um, not a permitted by right, but requires some additional entitlement, like a conditional use, then the applicant would need to apply for a conditional use permit, um, and it would come before the city planning commission and ultimately the city council. But that determination of what um, what process, what review and approval process. Um, is going to apply is going to depend number one on what is the specific development plan that is ultimately submitted and two what is the determination made by the Department of Safety and Permits as to whether it comports with the applicable zoning regulations. Thank you. And I think on, on behalf of the public obviously seeing documents that say development plans submitted for safety and permits and it being a series of buildings um, as a hotel, you know, is rightly so along in public input. So thank you for that information. Um, I have Bob? A oh, go ahead, Kathleen. Okay, thanks, thanks. Um, so, so let's if hear I understand from, uh, correctly, I'm sorry, Commissioner Stewart? Commissioner Lund, then Commissioner Weaver. All right, thank you. Um, Bob, if I understand this correctly, what you're saying is that according to the requirements, if according to our subdivision regulation requirements, if it if it qualifies for a subdivision, a minor subdivision review, which this did, then you're compelled to, if it complies, to um, approve it. Right? You're not. There's no. Uh, it, we're not allowed to ask about what the use may be. If it complies. It's not that you're not, you're allowed to ask anything. Um, okay. The, the, um, I think the, um, the question is whether, is, is what is the scope of the review? So if you are seeing that development plan as part of a conditional use process, then we'd be looking at the regulations for conditional uses and applying those regulations and those criteria as to, as to the application. This is being presented as a subdivision, so we look to the subdivision regulations for guidance on what is appropriate um, and subject to review and approval. And so, what what I'm saying is that, is that you know I'm not 
suggesting um, by any stretch of the imagination that the use is approved or that the subdivision is um, foreclosing any conversation about the use. In order to whatever is proposed for the site, there will need to be approval on the subdivision. There will need to be approval on the zoning front. Those are two separate processes. They're spelled out as two separate processes in state law. They're spelled out as two separate processes in the charter and in the zoning ordinance. And so that's why we have a separate zoning ordinance and a separate set of subdivision regulations because they are two separate processes with two separate review and approval processes. They're not interchangeable is what I said in the, in the, um, in the memo I wrote to you and there, and neither, um, is, um, neither supersedes the other. The applicant will have to get both approvals on both sides. Um, and there are processes set up on, um, for both, um, to, um, to review and to move forward, um, for consideration on approval. And um, the zoning ordinance has, you know, certain things are permitted by right. Certain things require extra process, like a conditional use, um, in order to move forward. And th that that again depends on what the ultimate uh, proposal is. Since we are, well, thank you, Bob. I just would, would like to ask the applicant then, what was your reason for requesting the subdivision into five separate lots from the one lot? at this point? Um, <clears throat> so that's a good question. And this is one of the things we talked about with city planning commission on the front end. The lot as currently constructed before the resale division was a sort of mazy all over the place. Um, and it actually was considered by um, city planning staff to be an improvement of the previous condition. Um, you know, this could be residences, this could be a number of different things, but it's, um, it was it was honestly to take what was kind of uh, an octopus to, through its way through the neighborhood and make it standard lots that comply um, and are actually kind of part of the neighborhood norm. All right, thank you. Can, can I follow up on that? So, sure. but you, we would all agree that you can't build a building across lot lines, right, Mr. Connors? So that would mean that you your client has to be planning to build five buildings, one on each, or build, uh, a, no more than a building on, on a lot. So again, this could be five residences. At this time, right. we don't have a development plan. We're looking at, we're looking at, we're searching for a development plan to be totally honest, but this process is the first step in the process for that. Again, whatever happens, whatever comes down the road, and there's a lot that goes into that, as I'm sure you're aware, but the economics of all these the decisions that are going on and what we're going through, um, it is, that is gonna go down the proper channel of the CZO and safety and permits and condition. And if it's a conditional use, we'll wind up back here as well and go through the MPP. And, and um, again, that's a process that we will navigate uh, moving forward. Again, today we're talking about the administrative approval of a, of a right. resubdivision that meets the guidelines, so. All right, uh, Commissioner Weaver. Oh, you okay? For the moment. Okay. All right, and, and I just want to clarify, at our last meeting, we did not defer this. We we declined this, right? Okay. So so at yes. this time, I'm, I'm going to ask Missy, if we don't take any action um, on this today and, and our actions from our last meeting uh, stay on the record, what happens? If you do not take any action today and leave it as is, it this the you deny the ratification of the subdivision and that decision is appealable to the city council by the applicant only. Um, the reason why y'all did that is because there was some uh, some um, not knowing what the dates were, um, and that way there we were worried uh, you wanted to give a public hearing, which I think we've had today. <laughs> um, and I, 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 we were concerned about the deadlines causing it to go past deadlines. So that's why you denied it. So there would be a public hearing in front of the city council. But now that we've taken this back up, we've de facto had a public hearing. 
Okay. And then we also heard from um, from our executive director, uh, Mr. Rivers, um, that we could um, commissioners just ratify um, and move forward or um, another recommendation I think outlined in his uh, memo basically says uh, to direct staff to have a, a whole CPC hearing, which Mrs. quite frankly said that probably maybe just took place today. Um, so at this time, uh, commissioners, um, are there any other comments, questions uh, for staff or a motion or um, whether on this docket or for adjournment or whatever action the commissioners see fit to take place? So, Mr. Chair, I do have one, just one more technical question, not about the, the, the property, but about our process. So one of the options presented was to, and I'm, 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 I'm looking directly at the, at the, the, the memo that was um, part of the public, um, uh, um, part of the public uh, uh, hearing today. And it says direct staff to schedule a public hearing. I, one of the challenges we talked about earlier is a timing issue. Um, uh, we've heard 60 days. And if we were to, and this, this came up, so uh, I appreciate council's uh, interpretation. I think one of the things that, that led us to the denial last time was also a timing issue that we heard that this had been on the docket for some time, um, well in excess of 60 days. And that came up earlier in the presentation as well. So walk me through this. If we go with staff recommendation uh, in part F number two, that is to direct uh, the staff to schedule public hearing. However, I, I, from a timing standpoint, I, I, I go back to where we were at the last hearing, what we heard in the first half, walk me through the timing because we're well in excess of 60 days. Am, am I correct on that? So walk me through the, if this body were to choose number two, what ramifications that has and where we're at in a timing basis. Sure. Um, so what, what we would suggest is that the 60 day applies from the time the application is submitted to the time that the um, notification is sent to the applicant that, um, that it is eligible, that basically the certified approval that is sent to the applicant. Um, that takes place within 60 days and it moves forward. Um, what, it, what I'm suggesting in my memo is that, and again, trying to read all of the different portions of the subdivision regulations so that they all make sense and that they all can, can happen is that, um, if the decision is made to, and, and, Recall that you, you did two decisions at the last meeting. One was to pull it out of the ratification list. And then two was to, um, to instead of ratifying it, to deny it. So what, what I would suggest is, is, or what I am suggesting is that the, um, if the commission chooses to reconsider that it would rescind the denial and do one of two things. Um, confirm the administrative approval um, that was granted by staff or hold a public hearing at which everybody could attend and state their case and um, and then take up that same question again, whether to ratify. I think there is a question as to, and, and again, this, this all goes to the, the requested interpretation that I put forward. And that is if the determination on whether to ratify the application is limited to whether or not it fits into the box of 
um, admi an administratively approvable minor subdivision, then taking it out of that ratification and saying we are not going to ratify it arguably says we don't think it's a minor subdivision and we think it's a major subdivision and therefore it has to go through the major subdivision approval process. Um, I, I think Missy's comment that, you know, I, all of the interested parties um, are here, um, have had their say. Um, and then, you know, to Mr. Connick's um, suggestion that, um, that I think that, that, you know, a decision is, um, an ultimate decision is, is certainly um, doable at this point. I think the concerns that I'd had about um, due process and, and all of that, I think are, are remote. If I could say one more thing, um, and, and this goes to, um, you know, what happens if the denial is upheld and it goes to the um, city council, because the suggestion from the commenters is that that would trigger a conditional use process. And that wouldn't be the case. The council would be looking at the subdivision review process and whether or not the decision to, um, that, that, that was made by the city planning commission um, is something that would stand. It's still going to be up to the department of safety and permits as to whether or not a conditional use process is going to be required. And that determination is going to be appealable through the Board of Zoning Adjustments. So, and that, that's if it goes to council or not. So I just wanna make sure that that is clear. Um, and Bob, can I uh, ask one more binary question that uh, on exactly what you're talking about? Sure. So we have two issues. One is whether to rescind the denial of the previous meeting. If we don't rescind the denial of the previous meeting, then the denial stands, and then the remedy is, to, is for the developer to appeal to the city council. Is that correct, correct. so far? Correct. If we do rescind and we confirm the administrative uh, decision, the, 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 the subdivision and it's an administrative action, um, then that's, that's a final action and neither side can ap appeal to either city council or court, that's final. So, if, we approve, if we rescind and approve the administrative action. Yeah, I, 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 the, the applicant could appeal. I don't think the applicant would want to. Well, but, well the applicant, um, but, uh, but I'm, I'm the, saying by the, definition, we, we've given the applicant what he wants. Yes. Uh, we've rescinded and we've approved the subdivision. The yes. opponents can't appeal and presumably the applicant wouldn't. Um, and then if we hold the public hearing, it is to decide the same thing of whether the administrative resub stands or not. So I, I think that's one of the things that I've asked you all to interpret. That would be the way I read the regulations. Um, I think there are other comments um, indicating that you have um, a broader right to um, to hold a public hearing and and decide it on um, on other grounds. Um, so, but ultimately it's your, it's, it's the commission's decision on how, on, on how right. to interpret the subdivision regulations because they're not necessarily clear on that. And ultimately the appeal issue will be the same. If we hold a public hearing and we uphold the resubdivision, there's no appeal by the opponents. And if we deny the resubdivision, there is an appeal to the city council by the developer. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any questions? Uh, any other remaining questions? Then no questions. Do we have a motion? I guess, I guess, Mr. Chair, the, the last thing I'll say, I, so I think, um, I guess the other place I'm, 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 I will say to my fellow commissioners, I'm struggling a little bit, uh, is there were some legal uh, um, issues brought up uh, in the uh, initial presentation. And without some sort of, of um, executive session to have uh, a candid conversation about the, the legal ramifications for the city, I have trouble uh, coming to a place where I can have those conversations uh, at this point. So I, I just need to say that out loud because 
Um, I, I don't really, there's some, some places where I feel like I have some blanks uh, uh, and some uh, uh, potential uh, liabilities uh, as we're weighing in on this that, that we probably can't have a conversation without being uh, um, in some sort of, of an executive session. Um, and I don't know that we have remedy to, to do that, but I wanted to say that out loud because I, 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 I that, that, that conversation of um, uh, legal that was brought up uh, as part of the initial has, 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 has clung with me on this. I, I guess I'm asking our council, do you have the same concerns I do? I might. Do you have a recommendation for remedy? <laughs> no, I mean, this, this is, this is basically a, a problem that was created because the subdivision rules are so old and confusing and we did not think think about them when we, I did not think about them when I led you down the path that I led you down last week. Miss, I don't think you led us down a path. I think that besides neighborhood opposition, I don't wanna speak for my other commissioners, but because of all the neighborhood opposition, and I don't think there was one person that had written that was in favor. And so as commissioners, our job is to listen to the public and actually make recommendations based on the information that we have, but also based on the standards of practice. So I'm with Commissioner Wigberg. I feel like I'm um, somewhat caught here because I stand by what I believe Commissioner Stieg had made a motion last month, but also we have some legal ramifications that I don't understand fully. Um, and it seems like there's a lot of confusion about what the development plan is. And now there doesn't seem to be a development plan except to resubdivide lots. And what does that actually mean? So there's a lot of confusion um, around this particular topic or rather docket item. And I'd like to make a recommendation on how to move forward. And I have copious notes here <laughs> of questions, but I'm not certain also how to lead us forward on this conversation. I, I, I agree uh, with Commissioner Whitry and Commissioner Weedberg, and um, I think we are in a spot. And I think that um, it, I think what has is, is changed since our last meeting was that there's no longer um, a, a plan um, for us, what, what might have thrown us in this gray area of whether it's a major or minor subdivision, which is what we want to talk about is no longer um, part of this. Am I, am I right on that? Or I, it seemed that the interpretation of the plan might have had something to do with this gray area about talking about whether this was within the administrative realm or not. Am I correct? The plans Who are you really asking? matter here because it's- we're I'm asking, um, yeah, the, the city attorney, you, Bob, or, or someone, I, I, I don't, I, I feel like that this, like as Mrs. said, this, this, the regulations have put us in this gray area, but also muddy with this was the plan that was out there, which sort of the way it was might have been interpreted differently by some which is no longer there as I understand. So let me, um, let, me, let me suggest this, that I think one of the reasons why um, in my memo, um, I, I tried to emphasize the distinction between zoning and subdivision is because regardless of what the plan is, the subdivision is the same. It's it and and granted that there are a whole host of very serious, very significant, very impactful decisions that need to be made around 
how the property is used. What I tried to emphasize in the memo is that there are processes for that, that, um, that provide for that review and that whichever way that review goes, there are avenues for public input to, um, to make sure that the public's concerns are, um, are, are, are made um, and are considered as part of those zoning decisions. I, I think that what I, 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 you did make that point. That's that's that was not really my question. That point was made, and I think you did very well done in, in the report. My question, I think, it was about, mostly about the, whether there was a street running through there, which is, I think, what threw it out for me. But since there's no um, no plan for that, it appears. But go ahead, Bob. I didn't. Mean, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, no. I, I mean, on that particular issue, I, I think that if there is um, if there is a determination made as part of the building permit review process that what is considered by some to be a street is approved um, and move forward as a approvable driveway, then that is a decision made by the Department of Safety and Permits that is challengeable through the zoning appeal process. And again, and, and, and I, the point I was trying to make was that whatever the development plan looks like, this subdivision plan is gonna look the same. And the, 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 the matters that are that are subject to the review of the sub subdivision regulations are going to be the same. All right, Bob, just, just for clarity on that, right? So if this subdivision is um, approved, right? Um, as is, mm -hmm. what are the next steps, right? The applicant would then have to actually come back with site plans with, for whatever use that they're going to use. I think one thing um, that draws concern to, to commissioners, then also the residents was the, the fact that it, they were not notified and it seems um, they didn't get specifics on what was taking place um, with these with these lots, right? So if a subdivision is approved, um, what does that allow the applicant to do without coming back before CPC? So, the applicant will need to look to the zoning ordinance to look at what are approvable by right uses and will have to propose something that is consistent with those regulations. And that plan would then be reviewed by the Department of Safety and Permits which would make a determination as to whether or not what is being proposed is compliant with the regulations or not. And that's the determination that could be challenged if the determination is such that um, there is disagreement by neighborhood groups or neighbors or, or any interested party. Um, that can be challenged and that interpretation of the zoning ordinance as to what is approvable from a zoning perspective would be determined ultimately by the Board of Zoning Adjustments, which exists for that purpose. That answer your question? Yes, that did. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments, or emotion? This is Commissioner Mobley. I'll make a motion. 
Um, I motion to maintain our decision from the prior meeting and to refer this matter to city council um, on the grounds that there are outstanding questions and concerns and overlapping fields of control that have been raised um, as well as shifting plans that have been raised in today's discussion. Um, and because I would like to return the favor of them endlessly sending things that are too difficult to deal with to our staff. Um, Okay. This is Commissioner Steeg. I second that motion, but without the last comment. Right. It's been moved by Commissioner Mobley to uh, to reaffirm our decision from last meeting and refer this bank and refer this to the to City Council, second by Commissioner Steeg. Is there any further discussion on that motion? And I just want to say that um, it can't be referred to the City. Right. city okay, because automatically goes. It's that the applicant has to appeal it to the city council. So that the onus is on him to appeal it to the city council. We can't, there's no mechanism to, for us to send this to city council. Okay. Yeah, and my second wasn't based, I mean, I think we were all, Commissioner Mobley, if I can speak for you, which I hesitate to do, but I think we were all assuming that if that were the case, that the um, applicant would, um, would file that appeal. In, in other words, the only, course of action we have where it can it, this could end up at the city council is uh, via Commissioner Mobley's um, motion, which is why I'm seconding it because I, I think this properly belongs uh, at the city council. All right. So the move by Commissioner, Commissioner Mobley to reaffirm our decision from last meeting and, um, and it's been seconded by Commissioner Steeg. Is there any, any further discussion on that motion? Any further discussion on the motion to reaffirm our decision from last CPC meeting? Hi, Commissioner Lawn, just I'd like to say that I, I think that um, Bob correctly uh, approved this and um, as a minor subdivision and had there not been a, a proposal for development a year ago that alarmed so many neighbors, we would not be having this degree, it, it would be five lots that could potentially be residential and other uses. However, fact is that there was a proposal that neighbors seriously object to and the same people who put forth that proposal are now asking for this subdivision. So it's suspect to many people. And uh, I understand that. So to the degree that we have an ability to um, cause this to be further reviewed, I, I wanna exercise that right. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion? Um, I, I just want to agree with both Commissioner Stieg and Commissioner Mobley and Commissioner Lund. My, my only problem with affirming our prior decision is that um, based on our director's report that it was within the administrative realm and can, if, if this on its face alone without a, a development plan, um, it, it was the development plan that raised the concerns. And I guess my thought is that there, there might be scrutiny at, at many other junctures in this process. So I'm, I'm, I'm not yet where I am to want to vote yet. So I'm not sure. <laughs> so I don't think that's helpful, but I'm just, since we have a motion on the floor, that's my comment. Any other comments or discussion um, on the motion? No, I, and I think I said this earlier, I, I think I think timing is a challenge. And so we made this decision at the last meeting and I and I'm going to support the motion again. Um, you know, I think uh, redirecting to a public hearing is 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 more an extra extra time. And uh, uh, I have some some sympathy for the time that this has been on the dockets and would like to see this handled expeditiously. 
Commissioner Witcher, I am going to support the motion on the table. Um, just feel like there's too many, um, there's too much confusion um, surrounding this. And so I feel that we should go ahead with our motion and uh, move to the next layer. I don't like messy dealings. And I also feel like I need to stay in my lane here. Um, and there's a lot of neighborhood opposition and I wanna see these properties go back into commerce and be developed. Um, but I think there needs to be an extra uh, layer involved in this particular item. Okay. Any other further discussion on the motion? Any other readiness? Any other on the on the readiness? <clears throat> All right, there's no further discussion um, on the motion. I'll call the question. Uh, Commissioner Brown. Um, I'll support the motion. Commissioner Flick. Yes. Yeah. Commissioner Lund. Yes. Commissioner Mobley. Yes. Commissioner Steig. Yes. Commissioner Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Wittry. Yes. Commissioner Weaver. Yes. All right. Unanimous support for affirmation of the decision from the prior meeting. Um, and at this time, that concludes um, everything that was on our, our printed agenda. I believe that was the last document matter. Um, and at this time now, the chair will entertain, uh, the, if there are no announcements, um, the chair will entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved, Commissioner Lund. All right, it's been moved by Commissioner Lund. Is there a second to the motion? Or Flick will second. It's seconded by Commissioner Flick. All right. Um, we'll take the vote in Globo if um, there's no opposition. Um, if everyone just says aye. 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 All right. Any nay? All right. With no unreadiness, um, um, the motion for adjournment is. Um, Accepted at 5.52. You guys have a great day. Yep. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody.